All right. Good morning and welcome to the live Studio Q show. My name is Quinn Jacobson and we're going to start this event by getting some of you inside of this live hangout. So let's see if we can do that. I'm going to start by waiting a minute to see how many viewers we get and who wants to come in. I'll see if I can send this out right now. Chat. Oh, open. Okay. There's there's Jeannie. Hi there, everybody. Okay. It's me and you right now. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Screen share. I, tell me what happens here, Jeannie. If I share this. Hey, picture in picture in picture in picture. Okay. The, now I see me. Uh, now I see you. Yeah. So what, what I'm... Yeah. Yeah, what I'm going to do is I want to share. Tell me how this looks uh, once I do this. Give me just one second here. People are writing they can't get in, and yeah. it doesn't start until 10, so we have three more minutes. But yeah, um, let me do this here. Uh, something invited you start video hangout. Uh, no, hold on, just one second. Oh. Live video calls. Yeah, I'm. Thank uh, you, show. Quinn Jacobson invited you. Yeah, that's what I send out to everyone. So hopefully everyone will get that. And what I'm going to do here, is see if I can pull this up. And pull this one out. I'll talk a little bit about these. I can't close Chrome. And the key data. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, we have four viewers, so we have some people coming in. If you have questions and answers, I think I turned that on. Yeah, here we go. Testing from Eastern Canada. Wonderful. All right, Dale, it looks like Dale might be trying to get in. We have three viewers now. Hold on here. We'll slowly but surely bring it in. Um, let me go back here. I've got to do, i got to set this up real quick here. I'll be back, too. i got to put the yogurt in the fridge. No worries. So that's a, on the live broadcast. Everyone knows that um, now we're putting yogurt in the fridge because Jeannie just had to go do that. <laughs> it's okay. It hasn't started. Let's see if I can do this here. File open, that's uh, 65. I'll open there. So if I do this, There, and if I do this, There and see how that goes. There, there we go. Jeannie? Yes. 
let's see um, let's see what this looks like if I were to do this okay um, say okay two viewers um, if I do a screen share wait no that's not that's chat okay screen share okay okay I'm gonna stop that what if I open this up and do this oh that looks great especially on my big screen here <laughs> that look good yeah okay that's all I needed to see hide that's cool and then are you are we oh. back okay yeah. Okay, I went big again now. Yeah, now now you won't be big. Okay, let's see if we can get some people in here. Yeah. Where is the Q and A? Uh, yes, cultured yogurt is not good. Okay, I can see and hear you, but I think I might have to accept me on your end. Okay, let's see. Um, I invited everyone. You should have a link, Dale, to to get in. I hope. I I hope we don't have to go all through this again. God, I hope this is easier than it was last let time. Others, yeah. Let others know that you've arrived. Okay, I'm a little bit confused here. Um, Okay, Dale. I'm not sure. Again, I I sent everyone a link, so they everyone should be able to get in. But I'm probably missing something again. I thought I had it figured out. I went through my Google Plus and I saw the invitation on my Google Plus, and I just clicked on it and I said join, and I'm a, I was in. Yeah, that's that's what I believe people have to do. So, if you heard that, um, you. Go to the invite. I've invited everyone. Go to the invite and accept the invite if you want to get in here. So anyway, I'm going to, it's 10.03. I'm going to wait um, just to, just for a minute and see if uh, anyone else can come in or try to get in. What is showcase? Really bizarre. Okay, we'll just wait. We'll just hang out here for a second. I can't see the board at all. What board? Your whiteboard, but that's okay, right? Yeah. You know, this is recording, Jeannie, so... Oh, okay. Yeah. We already had a comment about the yogurt. Oh. <laughs> Can you see that now? A little bit? Yes, there it is. Okay, so I'm going to wait until 10 after 10, and then I'm going to start because I'm on kind of a timeline myself. So if we can't get in, I can go out and try to send the link out again, but um, settings, default, default voice. Um, but if I can't get people in, invite people. Okay, so... Here we go. Share the link. Um, quiet invitation. Extended circles. Friends. Acquaintances. I mean, I don't know. Collodion is 22. Invite. Hey, Quinn. Hey, there we go. There's Rob. How's it going, man? Not bad. Welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be back, actually, in yeah. some ways. Um, so Rob's in, so we just need to take that link that I sent you and click in, and you can get in. I think yeah. I can have up to 10 people in here. So yeah, It's like Jeannie said. You have to go to your Google+, Plus and there would be a little window, and you sit and just click on the uh, invite. Perfect. So everybody caught that. I guess we've got six people in here and us. Um, and it's growing here, so we'll we'll wait for a minute. I have not had an invite on G. Uh, Dale said, um, "Let me try again. I'll send you one direct. Um, both uh, Tony as well too." 
Um, yeah. Pleasure I'll, having to do because I was watching you, Quinn. Yeah. I could close out what I was watching and go to my Google Plus page and hit the link there. It's okay. Five okay. So you guys heard that that can see us and and but can't respond. I just linked through again, following your link. I can see and hear you and Jeannie when you turn her on. Um, okay, let me let me go out and send these directly to Dale Wilson and Tony both, right here. Uh, invite people, um, Dale. Dale Wilson, right there. Um, D Wilson at nssimpatico.ca and Tony. It's well, there you go, and I'll put Tony, I think Tony Pig will be in there as well too, so I'm going to send, so there goes three direct invites, um, so Tony T and Tony S should both have one, so I have not had an, or a link, so check now, I sent a direct link to your email, you may, like Rob said, you may have to close the, uh, there's, there's, uh, there's Tony, Mr. T, there you hey. got him. So yeah, we'll just we'll just let people trickle in here for a minute. We 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 have a few minutes here. Those of that you want to get in on video, we can have up to ten people in here, and then the other people will just have to do Q and A. Um, and I've got that open so you can ask questions or whatever you want if you don't have a voice or a video feed. Not sure. Control room. Again, a lot of this stuff I have to uh, uh, learn on the fly, and the only way you can learn it is by doing it, uh, by being in here live. So it's kind of a hassle that way, unless you want to start a, a live hangout and go from there. I will show you this, though. This is pretty cool. Um, share. Boom. Share this. Look at that. Looks great on my end. Yeah, that's pretty cool, isn't it? I think it, I think it works well. So okay. at least I'll be able to um, at least I'll be able to start um, sharing stuff this way. And as we go on, we can um, kind of perfect this. Present to everyone. You are screen sharing. Stop. There I am. All right. So we'll give a couple more minutes. See if anybody comes in. We've got a few viewers popping in here. Um, We'll get started. I'm going to first. I'm going to talk okay. about the UN. Um, I've got that open, so you can ask questions or whatever you want. If you don't have a voice or a video feed. Yeah, let's uh, mute that. Not sure. Okay, am I feeding back on anybody? Is it coming through twice? I don't know what just happened there, but. No, you sound fine here. Okay, so today. Control room. I don't have to. I keep getting feedback. Today, yes, Tony speaks. Fine. The only way you can learn it is by. I, uh, Dale Wilson joined the. There's Dale. There's Dale. You're in. Hey. Welcome. Hey, is that me? Yeah. yeah that's you. Ah, ni hao. Ni hao, ni hao. <laughs> Jeez, what a convoluted process cool, this it? was. <laughs> Thanks. It works well. So. Okay. At least I'll be able to um, be able to start um, sharing stuff this way. As long as we can um, kind of perfect this, present to everyone. You are screen sharing. Stop. I don't know what's there going I on. <laughs> I hear myself feeding back through. <laughs> Does that happen often? No, only <laughs> only this time. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover the uh, UNC show, the University of Northern Colorado. Um, we just closed that out, and there's a couple of you that uh, might be in this chat that's in um, that's in that show. I'll talk a little bit about that. All right. well, of course, the big one is China. Um, I'll go to a lot of that. And I want to show you some of the work that I brought back. I want to show you some of the um, things they're doing at the academy in Hangzhou that will directly or could directly affect you as a Collodian photographer or a Collodian artist. Um, we'll talk here. about um, what kind of relationship I'm with that means. Um, so I don't know why I'm getting terrible feedback here. Do you have a speaker turned on? Uh, yeah, well, I got it here, so yeah, I do. That's, that's the source of your feedback, I suspect. 
Okay, am I feeding back on anybody? Is it no. coming through twice? No. I don't know. Are you guys hearing that or not? No, you're fine now. Okay. Fine now. Okay, hopefully that'll hold. I don't know. That was kind of strange. So, yeah, the big news is China, and then we'll talk about um, uh, some negative making if uh, w when we get into that. But, yeah, I want to start with the University of Northern Colorado um, exhibition. It's going to be a good one. There was 104 images submitted to that show, and I think I narrowed it down to 22 pieces, uh, 22 uh, plates in that show. Um, the the Marion Gallery, I think it's a Marion Marion Gallery at the, in Greeley up there. It's about an hour north of me here. Um, they have a beautiful gallery. Um, I've been working with a gallery director. Her name is Joan. And what we're going to do, the show runs from, I think, 20 July to the middle of March or something like that. And there's a lot of good work. Uh, there was uh, more work, more good work than I was uh, anticipating, actually. I, probably a negative thing to say. I don't mean it in a pejorative, but um, I was kind of surprised at how much good work there was. And what I tried to do, not only when I juried the show, I tried to select work that was both unique or interesting in content and also um, because this is a general public show, try to, I tried to bring in some of the um, more unique aspects of the variance of this process. So for instance, um, of course I select, I didn't select based on is it a black glass ambrotype or a clear glass ambrotype or anything like that. I, I, uh, hey, I just saw Tony S. pop in there. Uh, welcome if you're in here. It keeps crashing. I'm getting error message saying the app does not load, so I doubt I'll be able to be live. I'll keep trying. Oh, isn't it? Okay, that's Tony T. Well, yeah, keep trying, Tony. We'll get you in here if we can. But So I tried to pick work in this UNC show that this is the first wet plate collodion show they've ever done. So um, I kept that in mind, and it has to kind of inform my selections because the general public will come in, and I, I kind of wanted to both give them the idea that the, 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 the process as a whole and some of the ideas that people are working in. So, for instance, I, I selected um, some carbon. There's a carbon print and an albumin print and some silver gelatin stuff printed. Um, not, just, not just glass or metal plates, but also paper prints. And, and uh, I thought that was interesting. It should make for a, a good, diverse show. But there was, there was some... I'm... I'm, I'm very interested in portraiture work, of course. That's mainly what I've done over the years. But um, Tony, open capture. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> Mini open capture. Smile. What are you doing? I don't know what it is. <laughs> okay. Well. So anyway, the the show. I tried to select work that was both suitable for the process and interesting to the public in general and tried to cover all the variants. So um, I don't view photos. He just took a photo, okay? He's hurt. He's <laughs> Lots of buttons working, Tony, just the wrong one. <laughs> yeah. You got all the buttons going, but yeah, exactly, the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we have a few people in here, so we'll, we'll keep going. Keep trying, Tony. If you need to take snapshots, that's okay. Let's see what he shot here. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. So you can, you can ca capture a screenshot there. Oh, and he's just showing us what he's seeing. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Do we want to know? Oh, just he's just got a blank screen. It looks like his... Um, his app's crashing or something's going wrong there, so I'm not really sure. I just think he's over in France. Google needs to get some new people, he says. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think it's the fact that he's in France and it's evening and he's on the vino. Uh, that could be. That's a very good, po highly poss a very po high possibility that that's, that's true. Um, so anyway, the show. Let, let, me, let me try to finish this thought. This, the show at the University of Northern Colorado... It's going to be a great exhibition. They're producing a beautiful catalog. Um, <clears throat> they asked me to select and put a piece of work in, and I'm going to put this one in. 
Actually, I, I don't even own this piece. Unfortunately, no wine, Tony says. <laughs> really, in France? I, I'm, I, I don't own this piece, but this is a piece I'm going to put in. Uh, this is that triptych that probably everybody's seen a million times. But the thing about it is, is um, that's probably some of my most favorite portraits that I've ever made. So I'm going to put that in while I still have it. The owner, um, uh, who lives part-time in Russia and sometimes in California, said he's going to spend more time in California after the 15th of this month, and then he'll make a trip up here and get it. So hopefully... Um, it's not too soon. Hopefully, I can tell him to come after March because that'll be in that show until then. So I put a piece in. Uh, John Tonai, the, the the director of photography there in the university, is putting a piece in, and then the rest is uh, basically the 22 or 21 or 22 artists. I can't remember how many's in there, but um, the the other pieces that I selected. But keep that in mind if you've got if you put work in the show. Um, Somebody's calling now. If you put work in the show, um, you might uh, you might um, keep your eye out for that catalog, and you'll get a catalog. You'll get, um, of course, there'll be coverage on the opening of the exhibition. And I don't know if I'm going up at the cl opening or the closing. Um, I'm not really sure. If it's the opening, I'll go up there next month. I'm going to do a lecture and a little demo and those kinds of things. So. That's the University of Nor Northern Colorado, Colorado in Greeley, Colorado. Um, great school, great gallery. It's going to be an excellent show. And congratulations to those folks that um, made it in. Um, next time, you guys need to submit some work for that, that kind of stuff. It's good exposure. Um, a lot of people, Tony, you found another button and called the phone. <laughs> yeah, he did. He did. Oh, you can see that, can you? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't want to say we're we're all we're all friends here. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Jeannie was talking about yogurt earlier, so that's okay. Um, so that's the show in Northern Colorado, the University of Northern Colorado, and it's gonna it's it's gonna be um, it's gonna be interesting because, like I said, that's the first real wet collodion show, um, for Holy, that's been supported by academia and the art world, so to speak. Um, here in Colorado, so that's that's nice. Um, Tony T, by chance, do you have the Hangout app downloaded? That's a good question, Rob. I think he did. He was in here last week, so yeah, I couldn't remember. Yeah. Um, so that's a UNC show. China. Let's talk about China. That's my that's my favorite topic for today. Um, China. <clears throat> I just have to s start by saying there are really no words to describe what. Jeannie and I experienced there. Um, as you well know, we've we've lived in Europe. We lived in Europe for a few years. We've traveled all over the world. We've been to some great countries and continents and beautiful places and wonderful things. But China really changed us in in, in ways that that are really indescribable. Um, you can kind of put words to it, but um, I found myself very um, inspired every day um, to make photographs. Uh, to, to looking at things in a different way. The, the, the people are amazing to me. Um, it's actually going to change my, my methodology or my workflow a little bit, if you will. I'm, go I'm going to add some things. Um, and I'm not one of those Americans that went to Asia and now I'm going to become a Buddhist and you know sit and, and meditate and all that. I mean, I, I get it, though. I do. I get it. I, I understand why people do that now. I never understood it before. I always kind of thought they were, you know, people who didn't have much of a life, and then they they discovered something that resonated with them, and they got turned on by it. And I, I get it. I understand that. We went through Buddhist temples. We went through, uh, um, you know, mount, remote mountain villages to, to Shanghai as a city of 24 million, 27 million people. So we experienced uh, China in that eastern south. Southeastern China would be the equivalent of maybe going to Virginia or North Carolina in America, basically. And if you take Beijing as New York City, and let's say we were in, you know, Charlotte, North Carolina, or something, geographically, that's kind of where it's at. And then the West is kind of desert. Such a huge country. We didn't scratch the surface um, at all um, in in there uh, as China as a whole. But what we did experience was the 
unbelievable love and kindness and uh, generosity of our host, uh, the the Mr. Lee, we call him Gray, and his wife Zena, and then there was a whole entourage. We had our uh, interpreter Stephen. Tony found a music button. <laughs> <laughs> or somebody did. Um, and beyond beyond that, I hear bells. I do too. Um, beyond that, it was uh, inspirational. Um, on the there, there's the practical and the personal, so to speak, right? The personal side of the adventure was it, it changed me in the way I view my own country and my own people and how I'm treated here and how people see the world here versus you know how that part of the world sees their day-to-day -day life. And I know it's it's probably not a fair assessment to paint with such a broad brush and say that all Chinese people are unbelievably kind and gracious. But I will say this, in, in those uh, couple, two and a half weeks we were there, uh, 14 days or whatever it was, um, I, didn't see, I, didn't, I didn't hear a bad word spoken, I didn't see an unkind act, I didn't see, we didn't see anything like that. Now, no traffic I, accidents or anything? Nothing, nothing. Um, and I know people can, can put on a show and put on a front, but um, not, not at that capacity. So I know there's some validity to at least that part, Hangzhou and Shanghai, that's where we were. We, were. we flew into Shanghai. It's about a three-hour drive, a 200-kilometer trek to Hangzhou. Hangzhou is a city of about 10 million people. We work primarily in Hangzhou and outside of Hangzhou. Uh, Mr. Lee's studio, or workshop as he calls it, is in the old part of Hangzhou. It's right next to the very old part of the town, which is uh, really phenomenal. I was able to do some portraits in there and do some other things. And that's where I made the uh, ever, you've seen it ad nauseum at this point in time, that's where I made that photograph right there, uh, or those photographs. And I'll just tell you briefly about these two images. Um, there was a little bit of a mix-up in my work being there for the exhibition. Let me back up and give you context to this whole thing. Um, my work was uh, in the biennial last year. I had three pieces in the bi Shanghai biennial last year. Um, and what happened was they didn't, uh, Chamonix Camera, who I entrusted those, and they were large plates, they were 40 by 50 centimeters, 16 by 20 plates, who I entrusted with that work, um, thinking, hoping something would happen in China in the next couple of years, that was in 2013, um, I just entrusted those plates to him. I didn't want him to send them back. Why? They just sit here anyway. They were in the show. You know, they were talking about doing uh, some other shows. So I left the plates there. And the coordination between Mr. Lee, Grace, the people that I'm working with now, and Shamani Camera, it broke down. And we didn't get my work in uh, the work that was supposed to be in this exhibition at the Academy didn't show up. They couldn't find it. Chamonix camera had just moved, uh, changed, moved house, changed locations. So what I ended up doing was um, I said, look, that's not a problem. I'm, I'm extremely um, anxious and eager to make some photographs here. Uh, so I made a few plates. I made a few plates in the old city, and I made, it, I made this uh, fisherman's uh, jacket and hat image. And this, this image, I made it as a diptych because the front, hey, there's somebody there. Tony, you made it in. Good. Or no, wait, that's a different Tony. We've got three Tony, three Tonys in here. Wow. That's okay. Um, let me see if I can get rid of this. I'm logged in We got a lot of stuff. Okay. Um. Okay, I'm just I'm just trying to look on the chat to keep up with it a little bit, but I'll go back to Q and E. So, <clears throat> oh yeah, okay, no problem, Johnny. That's cool. Uh, I think he's in in the um, in Norway, I believe, somewhere in Scandinavia. So anyway, going back. Hey, there's Tony S. Isn't it? No. Yeah, it's me. Can you hey, man. Me? <laughs> yeah, I see it twice up here, one muted and one not muted. So we only have two Tonys, but welcome. 
So anyway, um, my work got was lost. It's still lost. Um, it's somewhere in Shamani's new company home. I don't. We don't know where it's at. So <laughs> I was inspired to make these two images. Um, and I actually ended up having four photographs in this exhibition. They they had people traveling from all over China, actually all over Asia, to come to see this event. So let me give you some context of why this kind of um, threw me off a little bit. Number one, I've been working. With, I've been working with the Chinese. The first Chinese person I worked with was a guy named Man Kai in Hong Kong, and I started working with him in maybe 2006 or 2007. I remember um, uh, uh, watching your live show. Oh, hey, Stephen's in here. Awesome, man! You got in. Cool. Yeah. Our, our translator's in. Welcome aboard, buddy. That's awesome. Ni hao. Yeah. Ni hao. <laughs> so um, I was kind of thrown off by what to expect, right? So I started working with a guy named Mon Kai in Hong Kong. Um, yeah, at least 2006, maybe 2007. I remember working with him in Europe. And I worked with him for a couple of years. That's when the Collodion.com forum board was very active, and Facebook hadn't really taken over. Um, Facebook had... Uh, <laughs> Tony, keeps, Tony T says, I'm here, but the control room app refuses to load. So uh, he's going to change his name. Too many Tonys, he's going to change his name to Sue. But... <laughs> <laughs> good, good Saturday morning humor, Saturday evening humor for some of you. Um, so anyway, um, I, I, I'd been working with Man Kai in Hong Kong, and I thought, wow, this is really cool. I'm, I'm working with, you know, I, I was in Europe, so I'd been working with the Europeans for a long time. I'd worked with Americans for a long time. And so now, in 2006, 2007, all of a sudden, the first Asian Collodianist comes on board and he contacts me. He gets my book. We we work things out. And in 2009, he he was actually the only Chinese person to actively well to participate in the Frederick Scott Archer um, plaque and memorial service, I guess, if you will, or uh, commemoration service, if you will, where we put the plaque on his grave and all that. We asked artists from all over the world to submit work and put work in and and have that um, memorial go actually, you know, be successful, and it was. And Man Kai, the Chinese, um, the only Chinese artist in the show, um, not only actively pursued and participated in that, but was very active in Wet Collodion in the following years. So the story goes like this. That was in 2006, 2007, became very active by 2009. He was, he'd send me emails about, you know, he had his little studio in Hong Kong, and he was showing the general public this process. And remember, and, and Dale knows this, and any of you that have been to China or know anything about the geography and the politics of China, Hong Kong is very different than the mainland. So you have to, you know, there's there's a kind of a separation there. Actually, um, if Stephen could get in here and and talk about it, he could he could tell you a lot about um, the the politics in China and the different areas, but. Um, so Hong Kong was a little separated from the mainland, but Mr. D, this young man, impressive in Beijing, this young man got a hold of Man Kai, or Man Kai got a hold of him, Man Kai, and started working in wet clothing. This was the first Chinese person, man or woman, to work in wet clothing in the main in the mainland. Other, you know, Man Kai is the first one in Hong Kong, and now um, Mr. D. I want to show you some Mr. D's work. I just got an email from him this morning, actually. Mr. D um, lives and works in Beijing and uh, made this gracious offer. He and his wife, Mia. I'm going to show you some photographs here. Uh, what a lovely presentation this is. Let me start off by just saying um, the Chinese completely blew my mind with presentation. Boy, it, it made me look so weak. I, I, I was humbled. I was humbled. I was... Uh, <clears throat> I've got a lot of food to, uh, food for thought here in the next few weeks or months or maybe even years to think about how this has impacted me and my work and how it's going to change my work a little bit or at least change the way I present and think about my work. Let's say it th put it that way. Um, so many sweet, kind, and loving people um, gifted us so many things 
but the presentation was always so beautiful. So I just want to show you this. This is Mr. D's. Um, um, I got the back page upside down, but or the back piece. But this is just a booklet of prints, uh, bound up a, a hard, thick cardboard back and front with a little image and a, a rubber band over it. I just love it. It's beautiful. Let me show you some of his photographs. He did. Um, he had images in the exhibition of the Beijing, some of the Beijing opera people, which were very beautiful. But he also had work like this. This is Mia, his wife. Um, and you know, I think Collodion and the Chinese culture fit like a lock and a key. I mean, it's just so visual there and so beautiful. Um, I just, just completely impressed with the symbolism of like lotus and daisies and and bamboo and and these elements. They really, I mean, it, as an artist, I I can't. How do I put this? I, I can't encourage Westerners, Americans, Canadians, uh, Europeans, wh whomever you are, whoever you are, I can't encourage this kind of trip more as an artist. And I think Dale, we'll let Dale chime in on some of his experiences in China too as well here in a minute. This really changed me. This really changed me. Yeah, you're not going to see me, like I said, you're not going to see me, you know, you'll see subtle things in my work that change especially now that I'm working with the land. But I'm primarily in, still interested in portraiture work. I'm just going to flip through some of his work here. It's really beautiful work, really well thought out, gorgeous work. And if I put my glasses on, I can kind of read what. Beijing Opera Actress. This is a 25 by 30 centimeter, one of one. It's in Chinese as well. Wet plate clothing, black glass, 10 by 12 inch original photograph. So Beijing um, actress. Just really beautiful portraits. Really beautiful. The last one was a piano teacher. Here's a pregnant woman. And look at the artifacts and fingernails and everything on this. This is, this is classic here. This is a really, really beautiful stuff. Um, really interesting, different eye. I love going to places where... I love to get out of my bubble, let's say. I love to be pushed visually and artistically in other cultures and places if I can get there. This is a carpenter. Uh, these are all 10 by 12. And really interesting how he's um, how he's got English on his T-shirt and he's holding this kind of interesting Chinese square. I would probably say it's a square up in the corner. But really, really nice execution of all of it. Here's... Uh, um, blind masseur, blind masseur, and massages are wonderful in China. I hope uh, Dale had one. When he got one when he was there. Just, just really beautiful, well executed, beautiful, beautiful imagery, beautiful, simple presentation. Uh, young girl, it's a beautiful, beautiful portraiture work. Well executed, beautiful portraiture work. Writer. I love this. Uh, I love this basketball boy. This is great, basketball boy. Uh, they love basketball there. It's really quite amazing. Well, yeah, I think they've got a couple of them playing in the NBA. Do they not? Yes, I, I believe. I believe so. I, I, you're the. I'm the last guy you want to talk about sports with. I can't even spell sports. I don't know what basketball even means, but. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't add that basketball was uh, a developing game. Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's, basketball's becoming yeah Chinese. Uh, I be because of the uh, Stephen knows his name. Um, I can't remember the uh, Chinese basketball player's name. Um, there are tall Chinese people, believe me. Um, <laughs> boss of art gallery. This is great. Look at what he's done with this boss of art gallery. Look at what he's kind of constructed there visually um, these these mannequins and a double exposure and you know just really thoughtful creative work even about the end of I don't know these individuals I would imagine it would give enormous context if you knew the the, the uh, people um, lady with an apple now now let's talk about this one for a minute look at this image guys lady with an apple like so you know, the first question I would ask, so my Western eyes go to that image, and we know what an apple symbolizes. You know, I want to know what that means in Eastern 
you know, these these ch images changes as you uh, uh, change as you change cultures. So we're going to view this very differently than a than a uh, person from China. Apple is you know significant in the Western world. So very interesting content. Here's a pipe. Red looks black. Awesome. Pipe maker. Like apple Look at how beautiful black. that is. You know, just elegant, beautiful, well executed. I mean, you know, what I found is a kindred spirit. I found a kindred spirit in the Chinese, the Asian people, that we think a lot alike when it comes to photography and art. We really do. It was amazing to me that I thought I'd go over there and not only look radically different, I would think radically different. Now, the first one I got, I look radically different, but amazingly enough, I don't look radically different than the Chinese. And it was amazing to me. And it was a... Uh, it resonated deeply, and it was a really, I, I don't want to sound hippie-ish, but it was a beautiful thing. It really was. Um, lady in evening dress. Just a really nice, beautiful, well-executed portrait. Can you stalk you for a minute, please? Yes. What The the uh, prints themselves, are they offset that you're holding up, or are they POPs? Uh, these are... No, these are these are these are did these are offset. These are printed. These are just these are like portfolio cards. Okay. But they look amazing. They're kind of a matte finish. They're just uh, they're just just portfolio cards. Yeah. yeah. Really. But why I'm showing this? Number one, I want to show his work, of course. Um, and he's a great guy. He's a wonderful guy. And I will collaborate with him. And and we're going to get to this, guys. But you're going to collaborate with the Chinese as well. I'm going to ensure that if both America and Europe get connected so well. <laughs> the Chinese artists and and vice versa and share uh, technology and information this is the main part of all about my missions uh, have publications exactly. all those kinds of things. I want to get I, I want to be the liaison or be one of the liaisons mm -hmm. to connect all you guys you'll feed off of one another like nobody's business I mean it's amazing and and this is within our reach because of technology teacher I thought this was kind of interesting look at his teacher you know, I, I can look at a portrait and I can I can tell what that that portraitist that that artist was thinking, or that that photographer or artist. I don't know whatever terminology you want to use. I can look at these portraits and I can almost tell you what Mr. D was thinking because they uh, I'm a portrait I'm a photographer basically, and and I know I feel in these images I know. What this he's thinking? This work is so closely related with mine and what I would do. I could be looking at my own photographs when I look at these. So it's a, it's a very kind of you know disorienting thing for me a lot of the time. Um, blind person, and and just just to emphasize that he you know made sure that that now you know this conjures a very different thing in Western eyes. Believe me, and you you all know that. I mean, I'm not here to, to have a critique necessarily, but maybe we are. I mean, this is all part of the game, right? This is this is all good stuff, man. One thing, you know, that I've learned over the years and that China re-emphasized tremendously is people want to hear about your work. People want to know about why you're making this work. People want to hear your story. We're all storytellers. Let's tell our story, man. And these people, these artists, the, this culture... In the right hands, this process can be, you know, for the lack of a better word, a great weapon to, to, to win the, the hearts and minds of, of, of people who you want to tell your story to. Like, you know, all work is kind of propaganda. All, all photographs are lies. They're all propaganda in some way. I, I totally get that. I agree with that. Um, but what you bring, your filters that you bring to the context of these images, and I'm bringing a lot to these, um, makes a big difference on how you process these images and what you think that artist, the intention of that artist, what is that intention of that artist? What is he or she trying to say to you, get you to think about, get you happy about, mad about, glad about, sad about, whatever it is that he or she is doing, we need to know and, and understand the intention of the, those things. And this is work that I just really felt resonated with me. Of course it's the content too, but, but I really felt a connection to this work, um, primarily because it's in a different culture, but it's in the same stylistic, 
and, and a philosophical vein is my work. Here's another teacher. Kind of a different story here, though, right? And, and it, isn't it weird, these uh, developer sweeps or these, these technical problems here that he's having look like bruises on his arms. He's shirtless. He's lighting up this cigarette. That cigarette is glowing a little bit. Um, really interesting context for a, quote, teacher. Uh, a Christian. How about this? A Christian. You know? And I thought, this is, this is strange and interesting. Christian, this is strange and interesting. But yet, look at my work. Muslim. I've got a Muslim woman in her Habib, you know, photographed that way. So what, what your eye goes to, this is, this is a philosophical image. This isn't just about this person. This is about this person's spiritual belief. This is about, this is about probably the most important thing in that person's life. That changes the image. And, and, and to, to, to Chinese eyes, to Asian eyes, Christians. I mean, that's just not, you know, although there are hundreds of millions of Christians in China now, it's a, it's a unique thing. So I get this. I, I get it. And check this out. Student. <laughs> Student. I hope you guys can see these okay. <laughs> I mean, I got a kindred spirit. I have many kindred spirits in China. I really connected deeply with, um, with both the people and the work. <clears throat> now he's got some landscapes here. I'll show you a couple of landscapes real quick, and then we'll we'll move on. But I wanted to share some of this. Wow! If that could translate over the the, the monitor, I'd show you that one. Um, here you go. Really beautiful. I mean, look. This is what I dream about going to China to do. Working along the sea, working along, making these landscape photographs. I mean, he's got some really dramatic things going on here. Um, I'll show you one more and we'll call it good. The wet sea. Now, Quinn, um, you said all of his work is uh, black glass? Yeah, this is all this is all black glass. Uh huh. It's all black glass. So look guys, the 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 we stepped the the tempo up a little bit. China opened my eyes up to not only what um, what the possibilities are in, in the sense of working collaboratively um, and, and having, you know, I haven't gone anywhere in the world to this point and, and had an experience like this, had people give me work. I want to talk to you a little, and, 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 and this caliber, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the, uh, the academy as well too. This is another thing that I was uh, Basically, completely ignorant about. So, forgive my, my ignorance on this um, um, for those Chinese that are watching or that will watch in the future. Um, when I left for China, like I said, I'll back up a little bit. I'd been working with Man Kai for years. I'd been contact, in contact with Mr. Lee or Gray for a long time. We'd talked about me coming over there. And I was like, yeah, what would the context be of me coming over there? Why do you want Quinn Jacobson to, to go to China? What's the context of that? Um, and basically it was this. Mr. Lee has a vision. He has a, a passion and has, um, how, how do we say, a drive. Uh, it, some people think I'm passionate, and I am. Believe me, I'm passionate. But Mr. Gray what makes me look um, somewhat weak in that area. He is unbelievably passionate about this. And what his vision consists of, or part of his vision consists of, is bringing the Asian artists, and, and, and he, he wants to think of bringing them up into the Collodian world like America and Europe. But what he doesn't understand is, is the talent is already there. What it's more about is connecting us. And, and I just happened to be the lucky guy that got to be part of this and gets to help connect Asia, Europe, and America. And, and I'm, you know, that, that is, that's where we're going with this. That's what's going to, to, to happen. So Mr. Lee has this vision, and he said, come on over. Um, we'll, we'd like to formally open a branch of the Collodian Collective. And you all know what the Collodian Collective is, I hope. It's the... It's the the, the small, quiet organization, if you will, that I started when I was in Europe to put that plaque on Mr. Archer's grave. 
Um, I felt personally indebted to Archer for and all this caliber. This uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the, uh, hey, well, the Academy. I'm gonna, this I'm gonna is another thing, thing that I'm gonna, Carlos, just for a minute, okay, because I've got feedback really coming bad. through of yeah. me babbling. So, welcome, Carlos. I muted you. I, I'll, you guys can jump in in just a second. So he asked me to come over and open the Collodian Collective. That's the that organization that, that I started in 2009 in Europe. Used that kind of umbrella, so it wasn't Quinn Jacobson and it wasn't you know singular people and use that umbrella so I brought Carl Radford and John Brewer in and and you know I wanted the UK represented there of course Archer's Brit it was British and to have a big old American standing up there didn't seem politically correct to me so I formed this Collodian Collective as an umbrella kind of organization to to make things go politically easier in some of the contexts that I thought that I would be working in and I was and so that Collodian Collective put that together uh, put that plaque on Archer's grave, and we um, moved on from there. Now, every time the collective, like, we haven't had a reason to fire the collective up again, but now we do, because Mr. Lee saw this as, a, uh, as an opportunity in, in the Asian culture to see this kind of um, structure built, and, and I completely agree with this, because you know, we as Americans and maybe Canadians and French or Europeans or whatever, whomever, whoever you are in this and where, whatever your nationality is, we tend to, uh, if it's as other than Asian, we tend to um, kind of just fly by the seat of our pants sometimes. And we don't kind of formalize things. And we don't, ah, come on, you know, we'll, you know, the Spanish say, manana, manana. And we say, ah, we'll get to that, we'll get to that, you know. Um, not the Chinese, not at least the Chinese that I dealt with. These guys are right to the, you want, they're going to do something, they're going to do it. I mean, straight up. This trip was an example of that. I couldn't believe they pulled this off. We started talking about it in August or September. I didn't say anything. I said, you know, I told Jeannie that we might be going to China. She said, what? And I said, I, I don't think we will, but we might. And sure enough, Mr. Lee pulled it together and brought the Academy and his organization, which is called the TLR Club, in together and then invited uh, Jeannie and I to come over. And kind of, it was both ceremonial and, um, you know, practical for us to go over for a couple of reasons, and I'll, I'll get to those. But the idea was to have the Academy involved, have the support of the Academy, the China Art Academy, and this Academy is the biggest in China. It's got 10,000 students. Um, and keep in mind, these are all things that I didn't know before I went there. Um, hindsight's 2020, right? It always is. Um, and so th the idea was to bring the Academy, Mr. Lee, and Studio Q, or Quinn Jacobson, and, and Jeannie, into, into make this formal thing happen in Asia. And we did that. And what I wasn't expecting was this. I wasn't expecting to walk into Hangzhou in this city of 10 million people and see this gigantic academy that's uh, the campus, they have multiple, there's several campuses, Camp I or campuses, I'm not sure, um, around Hangzhou and 10,000 students, uh, uh, incredibly fired up group of, of uh, people about the art of photography and these beautiful exhibition halls where we, where we they, Mr. Lee did the, did the work, where they hung the show and we had the exhibition. Um, it blew my mind. I was like, okay, wait a minute, this is serious, okay? I knew I knew I was going to meet some important people, I knew I was going to do some interesting things, but I didn't really comprehend the, um, how important, how important this, this was or is. So that, first off, I had to change gears and get my head into, okay, we got to ramp this up a little bit. And so mentally I did that and, um, and we pulled it together, but we had this ceremony, and I want to tell you about it, and then I'll show you some work in this book. There's actually, this is a catalog of the, um, unfortunately there's no English on this, but this is the catalog of the Academy for the last 10 years, and I'll show you some wet plate work in this. Um, and I worked with Mr. Zhao, please forgive me, Stephen, if I'm butchering his name. Um, I worked with the, the head of the department there in, in the Academy. He was through with, you know, he was through the whole process. We were with him, um, 
shared some wonderful meals with him as always, had some interesting discussions in the workshop with him. Um, he made plates in the workshop. That's what the workshop was, by the way. It wasn't random Chinese students. These were all academy instructors or professors that, that came into Gray Studio. That's who the students were in this workshop. Um, and um, Mr. Jiao, we also had uh, not only the exhibition, but after the exhibition opened, we had this round table, this, this seats of 20 or 30 people, and, and these, I sat, Jeannie and I were in on it, and uh, there was a couple, few other people in on it. Um, some said a lot, some didn't. And they just kind of pre, um, I guess, told me, let me get a drink. They just kind of warned me before the round table, said you might have some opposition, you might have some resistance, uh, some opinions that may not be similar to yours about this process, about the use of it. And I got really excited when I heard that. I was like, yeah, let's let's do this. I, put me in the pit. Put me with, throw me in the lion's den. I want to go. I want to go. So not to argue, but to see if my case about how I feel about this process and the philosophy of using it is defensible. Can I defend this? Can I make my case strong enough in this in this culture in this literally around the world from where I'm at can I defend this process can I make um, this process seem in, uh, or not seem but but um, reveal itself as uh, how incredibly and important it is to some artists working in it and so I tried to make my case um, I think I impressed um, one person which happened to be the head of the department of photography at the University of Shanghai um, which is probably a good person to impress because at our last business meeting he gave me an open standing invitation to come and do lectures at University of Shanghai. So I'm, I was happy to hear that. But at this round table we had discussions about why is this process coming back? Why are Americans and Europeans flipping out about this process? What is this big deal about this process? And I was there to try to help answer those questions or, or to at least give my opinion about it. Um, you, if you know me at all, guys, you know that my my position on this is very, very clear. My position on using this process it, it has been clear from the get-go, uh, many, many moons ago. Um, I was using it for a purpose. For it informs the work. It supports the work. It's not just random. It it's it's a, there's a purpose behind using this. And so, when I, as I say that, obviously it's not for everyone, and obviously it isn't, which is a good thing because, um, you know, we see what happens when something's for everyone. It doesn't work out so well sometimes. So, um, this this round table was interesting, and it and it spurred some, some the discussions and some of the thoughts uh, we were having. Uh, I didn't catch all of it, of course, because of translation. I had to, and Steve, and I hope you're still in here. Um, I had to dumb it down a little bit, you know, to help Stephen. Wonderful translator, though. The man's incredible. Jeannie was trying to teach him uh, idioms and uh, English idioms, and he knew so many of them, and he knows so many of them. But it, it really opened my eyes to how many idioms we use in English, or at least Americans do. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll skin that cat at another time. Not a bad, not a good not, choice. Of, not, a good yeah, choice right. of, not a good phrase. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but you, you'll forgive me though because I'm an ignorant American, and this is my first time. Doing this, so, um, but uh, Stephen will like that. It, it, if it would have, I didn't see any dogs. I didn't see any cats. We ate some. We ate oh, some scrapings on the street though. But um, so the idea there was to bring the academy, Mr. Lee's workshop or studio, and Studio Q together to formally build this the Clothing Collective Asia. And Mr. Lee has set up in every part of China a representative for the collective. Now, what is the purpose of this? What, why are we doing this, or why is he doing this? Because he's really he's he's at the tip of the spear. How about that one? He's at the tip of the spear. He's leading this. He's going into this. We're, I'm basically consulting and helping where I can, and I'll be sending him care packages every month of of different things because you know China. We have the you know, unless you have VPN software, you're not getting on Facebook or you know the web, the internet is is a is a difficult thing. That's you, you saw my radio silence there for a couple of weeks. It, it, it sometimes it was it was difficult, but 
So we, we, I'm going to put packages together, and I'm going to work with him personally, of course, and and we'll we'll probably return every year for a while. Um, that, at least that's kind of the plan now. We'll see how it goes. Um, and and the really great thing is, is I got an email from him um, two days ago, I believe, two or three days ago, and he's uh, opening a gallery in Hangzhou in a really nice area in Hanjo. Now this is, a, this is a place where you want your work exhibited, guys. This is a place where you want to have uh, a shot at, at getting your work into that culture. And I'll tell you two reasons. The same reasons apply when you look at Chinese, when I look at the work from the Chinese, this is fresh to me. This is interesting to me. Yes, I connected with it, and I say it's kindred, of course, but it resonates with me, but it's fresh. It's different. It's not the same. You know, we get this, <clears throat> I don't want to offend anyone, but, but sometimes we're beating this wet plate process drum so loud, um, we forget about the content and the context and the intention of the image and why it was made and what the purpose of it is. The purpose of it isn't because it was made in wet colonian. I mean, that can be some of the purpose. It can support it for sure, but it can't be the primary reason. So um, going into that, that culture, going into that place, um, the work was more about context and intention rather than the process. I mean, the process was there. It's, it's kind of hard to you know articulate here. But you kind of know what I'm saying. It's your work in China will be viewed very differently or, or similarly, if you want to say it this way, as work that we're going to bring from China and exhibit in America or Europe. And we're going to do that. We're going to have group shows. We're going to have work um, from American and European and Canadian artists. Let's, let's say North America because I don't want to leave our Canadian brothers and sisters out here. Um, we're in South America. We're, we're, I mean, Americas and Europe, let's say. We're going we're gonna, to... We're going to connect all of these places together and do collaborative joint work and show the world the very best and the most interesting work in, in, in this process, these processes, I should say. So having said that, let me throw this out there, and I'm going to turn the floor over to you guys for a second, um, see what you guys think. The first project that Mr. Lee would like to do and collaborate with uh, North American, South American, let's say the Americas and Europe, Europe, European artists is this. He wants to make a wet collodion film. And what that means is that we'll take, um, for the artists that want to be involved with this, the, the film will, will be probably 15 to 30 images. It, it will be, it won't be, you know, 30 frames a second, of course. We'll probably cut that in half or a little more. And you'll pick a topic, and we, we're not sure yet what that might be. It may be open. I'm not really sure yet. And, for instance, let's say um, you're opening a can of something, and you'll pick a topic of just a scene that's one or two seconds long in Collodion that you open a can, or you shave your beard off, or you wh whatever you might do in those 15 to 20 to 30 plates that it takes you to make that. I don't know that I'd be trying to shave a beard off in uh, wet collodion, but maybe more of a still life scene that you can move objects. Okay, I'll, I'll relate it this way. When I was 8 or 10 years old, the, the best gift that I ever got was when my mother and father told me that I could shoot two rolls of 8 millimeter film in our camera. I was ecstatic. I was over the moon. So I took that 8 millimeter camera and I put my tennis shoes in the driveway and I clicked off a few frames every couple of seconds, and I had my tennis shoes walk across the driveway. I thought I was Steven Spielberg himself, right? This was a huge thing. This, this is the same kind of thing that we're talking about doing with Wet Collodion. And I know John Coffer, I don't, um, they, don't really, they don't really know anyone in America that way. They don't have any context for a lot of these names and ideas. They don't know who John, they, they, they do know who John Coffer, they don't really know who John Coffer is, they know, they think he's a mountain man that, you know, or something. They, they, they use his recipe because, it, yeah, they use his recipe. His recipe got filtered in there somehow, and, and some of them use his recipe for those that can't get, like, ethanol or cadmium bromide or ether is difficult to get. Um, they use his, like, dry, whatever it is, ether-free recipe, all alcohol. I can't remember what they call it now. Um, 
Is that the Pope? Wrong. I don't know. What, I don't know these names. Anyway, so but they they don't really know anybody. The only person they really know and admire is Sally Mann. Um, they they do know Sally Mann, but or know of her. But so the context of all of this. Where was I going with this? This this stop action film in Collodion. This first collaborative project they want to do. Um, I know John Coffer has already done one. They they don't know that, and it's irrelevant that he's you know that in that context because it's not really collaborative. But um, so uh, when I get more information on that, definitely I'll share it. But just keep that in mind. It's so if you want to start participating in some of these things, and I know a lot of people will, um, and I was impressed with how many people put in for work for that UNC show um, all over the world too. I want to get my American, North and South American brothers and sisters and my European brothers and sisters connected in with China, Asia. And this is a good way to do it. Now, what will happen with this film? If you know the Chinese, something will happen with this film. True. It will either be in the um, Hanzhou show next year or it will be in a show with with maybe certain pieces of your work in with the movie in an exhibition who knows it'll end up exhibited in China and the Chinese people will be able to experience and look at some of the beautiful work that we were able to look at with with fresh new eyes and interesting eyes so um, I'm gonna take a break from talking uh, and let you guys jabber for a minute if you have any questions unmute yourself and uh, if you have any questions, fire or comments, fire away. Not everybody at once, though. Come on. <laughs> Settle down. No, I have a lot to digest in that statement, Quinn. Oh, I okay. Think about it. Okay. Yeah, that's fair enough. I'm nice. I know. I, I have so much to say. I feel like I'm doing a complete brain dump download right now, so forgive me if I'm a little bit excited. I, I, I am. I am excited. I just I just see so many great things um, that are going to happen by by opening this part of the world. Oh, uh, Mark Zimmerman says sign me up for any collaborative projects with the Chinese. It sounds great. Yes, and that's the kind of that's the kind of attitude and spirit uh, we have to have. You know, and the best thing about it is it's not just getting your work out there. And and by the way, the Chinese actually buy artwork. How, that's kind of weird, isn't it? People, what you're gonna you're gonna buy my artwork? Wow, you know, so um, there, you know, on that side of the house, if you're interested in that, you know, absolutely, that this is the market you want to go in, guys. The future is is there. Believe me, the future is there. That's that's all I can say about that. Um, Tony, it's Dale here. Um, I sent you a private email, but I'll just uh, take one sentence out of that email so the others hear. Uh, and for those that don't know, I spent two months in China, and my one of my sentences to Tony was, "Told you so." <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know what I mean, don't you? <laughs> I'm just sitting here grinning like a rat chewing onions. Uh, <laughs> to to listen. That's a, that's a good idiom. That's a proper idiom. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, well, it's four four legs as well, so one ought to be careful. Um, they eat them too, so <laughs> so yeah, I'm told. Yeah. So I'm told. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, you you made a comment uh, way back when you started showing individual artist. Uh, I I can't recall his name. The small portfolio. Mr. D. Uh, Mr. D. Yeah. Okay, you made a comment there that that struck with me, and it was one that I also uh, can can relate to much of what you're saying. But that that one particular body of work struck with me. And your comment was that the Chinese are so much further ahead than we are in the Western, and I can't speak to the European world, but certainly in the North American world in the presentation of their work. Yeah. Uh, I've often felt that this is one area that we lack. We spend all this time and energy trying to create works of art, but then we don't know how to present it to its best advantage. And we could take some, or I know I shouldn't say we, I shouldn't speak collectively, but I know I can have and can take Huge lesson from the way they present their work. Yes. It's incredible. The work yeah. they the presentation well, is so important to them that it's it's and unless you understand been there and seen it, it's really hard to put it in context. But they yeah. understand the respect they have for the work is not completed until they 
present in such a fashion that shows that respect. So I'm glad you picked up on that. That was and made and made a public comment on that. Uh, it's well, certainly well, something that resonated with me. Well said. Thank you for sharing that. That's that's uh, you said it much better than I could have ever said it. That's that. Uh, well said. Um, and I totally agree. What I learned and sign me up on that list. I'm I'm the first in that line of core presentation. Really, I I I, I absolutely. It, it, and it's interesting to think about this because when we think about how much effort we put into our work, how much effort we we put into making these photographs, and and then. And then we kind of, you know, it's kind of like getting right up to the top, to the peak of the mountain, to, to see the view, and and you 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 fall back down. You don't you don't complete that all the way. And I I totally learned that. That that's something that 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 just stood out to me. Like, wow, Quinn, you have failed miserably here. You've got to step your game up because just like you just said. It's it's the final step. If this work is so important and so precious, and if you and respect is, I have to that that is the word that sums China up for me is respect. If you respect that work, if you really believe that that work is that important, why does it look like this at the end? You know, and it, and it's it's so true. Well said. Thank you for sharing that. That's that's and and that's one one area that I will personally be working on um, a lot. Um, I'll share this one thing with you. We went to this place in Hanjo, and I wish I had Stephen in here. Um, I hope he's still watching. So don't forgive me, Stephen, if I um, butcher this. Um, for the lack of a better word, it was like a calligraphy retreat. It's where these masters of calligraphy um, worked and still work in these generations all down through like gardens and sprawls of this beautiful space. I'll, I'll, I'll bring some photos up here in a second and show you the space. Um, but but it's, it was all about calligraphy, and I love calligraphy. I've always loved calligraphy. I've never been able to do it. But what I learned about that was not only was the, was the, the gardens and the area beautiful, and it was like an artist's retreat. It's like, man, I'd love to come here and stay here for two or three months and just chill out, right? What I learned there, and Gray gave us this this um, calligraphy kit, a presentation. Maybe Jeannie, would you bring that down, please? Yeah, I'll go get that. I, I'm gonna show it to him. Um, and and I want to I want to emphasize this presentation idea because this is so important. Um, but in that calligraphy retreat, as what I'm going to call it, we learned about all the masters. I, I was able to meet Master Wang, the best calligrapher in China. I had his portrait done with me at, at the gallery at the exhibition near my work. Um, uh, he was very interested in wet plate, which was very interesting because the, the calligraphy and wet plate have so much in common, it blows my mind. Um, but what I learned about this was um, that calligraphy, for art to be art in China, and, and, and a couple of you probably know this already, it has to have not only the calligraphy, but it also has to have a stamp, right? It's not art unless it has both. So I had these little stamps made. I just stamped them on here. But I had these little stamps made. I'm going to stamp. That's mine. Quinn in Chinese and Quinn in English and Jeannie in Summer. I'm going to start stamping my prints. I'm going to stamp every single pot print that I do. That's going to be my, my kind of Chinese, my throw to the Chinese, to the Asian world. I'm actually going to probably have a bigger square stamp made, a really nice. Uh, bringing those. Hey, okay. thank you, Judy. I think it's called the chop, Tony. C H O P. Yeah. And when you get that made, I had one made when I was in, uh, I think it was Beijing or Shanghai. I can't recall, but you're going to have some great difficulty because, and I, I certainly don't understand Mandarin or Cantonese, but my understanding is they always put S O N after the surname, so it would be like John Sun. So when they get to Wilson or Jacobson, they go. Ah, uh, so Jacob son son. <laughs> so, yeah, they, they have they, some challenges with that. <laughs> yeah, they, so, they never they, they only ever call us Quinn and Jeannie. So, yeah, so I, was, our, I was called our, Wilson. I was called Wilson son for about four weeks. <laughs> Wilson son, that's awesome. That's great. Good point. Yeah. Um, this is this is uh, something that Gray purchased for us in it. So so just to make my point, um, that kind of you know importance of 
uh, you know, and I'll talk about the fan shape and all these kinds of very important symbolism. It, it changed my way of thinking, not only to incorporate, and I, I don't know that I'm going to incorporate any Chinese elements into my work necessarily, but the connections between these things are very important. Okay, check this out, guys. Here we go again. The stamp and the characters, and look at this. Talk about presentation. There's a calligraphy set that, that he got. Oh, that's gorgeous. And these Chinese characters mean three stones here. And we got our photograph done over the, the three stone area there. Just, just really beautiful. It's all about this, right? And so I immediately translate all of this into photography work. How, you know, all artwork influences and informs my own work. How can it? You watch a movie, you, you, you read a book, you, you see, you go to a calligraphy retreat, you go to a, um, a, a oil painting show, a, a three-dimensional pottery show, ceramic show. Um, we did that as well, too. Um, all of that influences me. How can it not? Influence is incessant. We'll never get away from that. So everything you put in will eventually be processed and put out if it means anything to you. If it doesn't mean anything to you, of course, it's not going to. But how can this kind how can this kind of experience not mean anything to you? That's that's what I'm getting at. And, and and coming coming out of my bubble, going to Asia, experiencing that will change my work. This is the first time in many, 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 many years that I have been literally can say wholeheartedly that this experience has changed not only my work, but the way I think the way I think about my own culture and inter interact with my own culture and the way I think about otherness and what, what that means. That's, a, that's the basis of my work. I'm sorry? Oh, sorry. I need to mute myself. Oh. Um, so, <laughs> yogurt? <laughs> yogurt? Is that still about the yogurt? No, the yogurt's over. We, we got the yogurt taken yes, care of. Um, I, did, I did do one thing that... that I don't know, people thought it was pretty radical. I didn't think it was that radical. I mean, if you know anything about me, it's not that radical. I did have a, a new piece put on my arm here. I, I had that put on in Shanghai. So this is uh, an, an amazing, by the way, this, the, 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 the artist that did this work, these Chinese characters, I'll tell you what it means here in a second. Um, this artist that did this work for me is a wet plate collodion photographer. He's, he loves the process. And of course... Um, Everything was gifted to us. I mean, everything was gifted to us. I, I mean, uh, everything was a gift. So you know, he, he said it was an honor for him to tattoo me. But I want to make this one practical point. He got his gun out. He started. He, he did the outline. He started working on it. And I said, uh, I don't hear the machine. Where, where's, where's no, 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 no technology. And I look down, and he's got this little tiny blue disc with these voltage. Uh, uh, digital readouts on it that he presses. Couldn't even hear the machine. I didn't even feel that. I mean, so so here's this weird dichotomy. Two days before, I was in this mountain village that had 20 people and it didn't have heaters and it, I mean, just crazy. And now I'm in Shanghai with this new uh, tattoo machine development that, that's putting artwork on there. It was it was crazy. The 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 the, the differences, the the extremes, if you will. But for those of you that know me, I have these this kind of table leg. It's a, it is a land of contrast for sure. The, I have this kind of table leg theory about my work. So I have four words. I have memory, identity, difference, and justice. Those are the four words that I kind of work from. Uh, my work is built around those ideas or philosophies some way. So when we were at the academy, I saw this calligraphy. Well, it wasn't calligraphy. It was calligraphy, but it was a posters for these uh, graphic design pieces and one of them was justice and I, I saw the characters and I thought wow that is cool that's kind of one of my tenants one of my four tenants in my work what informs and supports my work and the characters look really cool and he said yeah that's justice and I was like wow I, I should put because my whole sleeve this is all about my life right so this is my whole heritage going up through the Holocaust my family my Hebrew name uh, done by a chauffeur's son in, in Jerusalem, Rabbi Dove, um, all the way up to the maze, the man in the, in the maze, exiting and entering life, the Diné bird, my uh, tribute to my mother, and then justice. And the whole the whole idea was to fill this, this... Every time I'm inspired, I swear to God, guys, this is so true. 
I got work in New York City in Manhattan. I got work in Paris. I got work in Denver. And now I got work in Shanghai on my arm. And every time I get inspired by something, I end I'm, up getting. I'm working it. In, really, that's Pardon? dirty. Inside it's dirty. Uh oh. We have feedback on somebody. Inside it's dirty. Um, <laughs> But uh, I hope it's not dirty on the inside. It's not. It's not for me. <laughs> well, it's okay. That's fine. But every time I get get fired up and get really creative, I end up or really expressive. I end up putting something, some piece of work on my body. So that was that was the reason that happened. And I also I love to collect. Um, this is artwork to me as well. So I love to collect this stuff. Um, around the world, if I can. So, so there were there were wonderful creative things happening there. But um, back to this land of contrasts, uh, which it truly, absolutely is. I want to have people um, really get on board and 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 help help me help the Chinese and help artists there. They're they're. You know, Europe was a wonderful experience for us. We lived there for five years. Uh, it was a wonderful experience, and and you know, I love my own country, but there's just something um, so compelling and different. I, I feel like there's there's this kind of um, creative explosion that's going to happen. I feel like China is going to deliver what I thought American Europe would deliver in wet clothing, and 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 help us all get there. I think they can help us all get there. I was I'm so inspired. Um, by Mr. D's work, I'm 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 inspired. I saw. I'll give a shout out to uh, Pierre, uh, to Cal. Uh, Cal is a, a good friend of ours that lives in Shanghai now. He's from uh, Brussels or lived in Brussels. He's where is he from? He was born in I think Egypt or raised in Egypt, and he's all over the place. A wonderful man. Um, met Christian, a, a, a French uh, gentleman. Uh, had outstanding work in the show. Uh, I mean. Now, I, I tell you, I saw Collodian work that I should have seen 10 years ago in this country. I mean, I, that's what I saw there. And, and, I, and I don't know what it is. I don't know why we can't kind of pull it together and, and do, you know, make work that matters somehow, right? I mean, I'm all for the equipment and talking, oh, what kind of lens? Are, how many salts are not Collodian yet? You know, I, I, I get all that. I, I understand it. But man, let's move into this realm where we're we're talking about making work that that we can share and exchange and even exhibit and even sell, even sell the work. How about that? Wouldn't that be a novel thing to do? I mean, those That's kinds great. of things really get me excited. I mean, that that just just the collaboration, just the inspiration you're going to get from uh, being exposed to these ideas, and for them. This is this is this is a true collaborative kind of thing. That's what's so exciting about it. And and we can work through this. We can make this happen. And I guarantee you, some of you guys are going to have work in, exhibited in China next year. I guarantee it. And you're going to have a response from that work that you've never had before in your life. And it's going to change you. And it's going to it's going to make you work more. And it's going to make you work differently. And it's going to make you think more. It's going to it's going to add all those wonderful attributes that you can't you can't pay for. You can't pay for it in a workshop. You can't get it anywhere. I don't care where you go. You can't get it. That culture will give you that. That's what it gave me. And, you know, I thought it was very interesting how much, um, you know, never talk about religion, sex, the number four, uh, Mr. Mao. Don't ever talk, you know, all these things, right? Uh, kind of BS, kind of bollocks, really. I mean, not really. Uh, Mr. Lee Gray talked about religion. We went through three Buddhist temples where he was converted. We walked the path. We did. We talked about religious immensely. Jeannie's a, a basically a theologian. My wife. Um, she. I mean, we talked religion constantly. Religion is important. While I don't agree with a lot of religions or the context of a lot of the religions, um, religious ideas, religious philosophy is definitely important. And, and we talked about that a lot. Um, I want to show you uh, Mr. Lee's work, and I'll do that. Um, I didn't have time today to get the little slideshow set up yet, but I will. You'll, this is just the beginning. This is the first rant on China. Um, so I'll do the big dump right now. Um, so the, the, the Mr. Lee, the first thing we did when we got to his workshop was 
he brought out work, of course. What you know, we're there to look at photographs, we're there to talk about photograph photography and art. And he lays these glass plates out on the table and he said, Talk about them, basically. He said, Talk about them. So I started looking at him and I see this cross. And I see immediately. I see uh, the uh, Islam. I see the cross. I didn't see a Jewish star, but you know that that'll probably get in there. I saw Taoism. Uh, I saw which I didn't get in the beginning. I saw the lotus for Buddhism. Um, he had all these different plates, and you know what they were? You know what they were photographed of, or what the photographs were made of? Not the not the actual material, but the content in the photographs. These crosses and moons and, and all these things, these symbols of religions, were made of basic Chinese, what you'd call peasant food. It was so incredibly moving, the connection of food and religion and these objects being, the, the, this material being put in to form these shapes of the objects, like base this basic Chinese bread that you, you don't call it bread. It's not even bread. You don't call it bread. Um, <laughs> Gene, you know, it's inside joke. Um, uh, to these uh, pancakes and duck egg, uh, this pancake and cut in the shape of a of, of a moon and the duck egg, this, the, the the circle and the yin and the yang and all. This is this is wonderful stuff and the connection between the importance of the food in their culture and the religions in their culture. And I was just I was just amazed that right off the bat, I'm, I go there and I get fed, I get given this wonderful gift of this person that has intent and context and power behind these simple beautiful images made by hand like the food made by everything in front of you I mean you go eat in a little shop and they're spinning dough and boiling noodles and oh my god are you serious you know I I, I was heartbroken to leave I was heart we were we were we were distraught to leave it was so, such a beautiful experience and and this is what I think we all long for in this culture. I really believe in the Western culture, we long for that serenity and that peace and that connection. They, Mr. Lee is connected to his work like I haven't seen. I want to say that I'm that connected to my work. I'd like to say that. I hope I am. I don't know that I can honestly say that after being there and experiencing some of this. But I'd like to think I am. But if I'm not, I want to strive to be more connected to the work. But it was such a beautiful gift to be given that right off the bat. There's Mr. Lee laying out his work and talking about this connection and this deep meaning behind these images made with this process that supports everything about the work, made with food, the giver of life, and all this religious and spiritual context. It was amazing. It was just phenomenal. And and these kinds of things just Im- immediately made me think, the, we have got to share this. We have got to get connected. We have got to share and, and exchange these ideas and information in this work. And that's what we're going to do. That's what's so exciting about this. And if you don't believe me, and if you don't uh, want to participate, I think it's your loss. But watch what happens in the next year. Watch what happens next year. Believe me. There are some things coming down the pipe that, that down the pipe that will just be you'll say, wow, I've, I've got to get on board with this. I've got to take advantage of this and be a part of this. And that means you sharing and, and being involved in, and communicating and, and being connected that way too. So for my brothers and sisters in Europe and, and, and the Americas, I want to formally introduce you to Asia and, and, and open those doors up and at least let me start to, to crack the door you guys kick that open. The Chinese will kick it open. Pretty soon, everyone in Asia and the Americas and Europe will be talking. And I think I think we'll share enough important ideas amongst one another that our work will change. It will get better, not only technically, but more importantly, contextually or intentionally. So that's what I want to share. I, I'll open the floor to you guys if you have any comments or questions. Green, hey. Pardon me. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, what about what about the the, the film that you you were uh, talking about the wet play collodion film? Yes. Um, I'll, you want? I'll talk a little bit more about that if you'd like. Yeah, please. Yeah, okay, please. that's Carlos. Carlos, welcome, man. It's good to see you, brother. Welcome aboard. Um, 
Um, this uh, this film, uh, Mr. Lee, and I'll have to get more information from him exactly, and I've, I've actually written uh, back and asked him these questions. Uh, we briefly talked about it, but I think, in, in essence, what the, the, the context of this is, or the intention behind this is, I think Mr. Lee wanted to have, or Gray, I'm going to call him Gray, that's what he likes to be called. Um, I think Gray's intention behind this is to formally um, introduce one another uh, continent-wise, if you will, to to do something on a collaborative project that can be put together in one central location and shown and exhibited either online or in the gallery or both. And then what I'm going to suggest is take a few, couple of three key frames out of this movie of your own clip and, ex and, and exhibit that with the film. That's That's what I've suggested right now. Now, is there a theme or a context to it? I'm not sure. You know, maybe maybe that's something we throw out there, and maybe some, that's something we have discussions about. But basically, what it'll be, if artists, photographers want to participate in, in these events, there, there's there's nothing to do with money. There's not none of this commerce BS or any of that crap. It's all about art and sharing culture and making work. So, if artists want to be involved in this, what they'll they'll end up doing is, I think, something like this. Yeah, 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 I agree. Uh, Dale just said to effectively cross all boundaries and make it universal. Um, yeah, you, you know, you, you'll have to have a theme. Of course, you don't go into a movie and kind of watch, yeah. It, it'll be a short film, but but thematically I think we can, maybe it's about food, maybe it's about hands, maybe it's about um, uh, garden objects. Who, know, uh, who knows? We'll, we'll figure that out. But uh, I think it's basically to introduce one another to each other and then to actually make work together that's going to be put into one piece that's one big collaborative piece uh, in the film, if you will. But I, but I still say I like to see the uh, images on the wall, too. But um, So what you'd end up doing if you wanted to participate in something like that is to make, let's say, 15 to 30 frames, and say it's 15 frames a second, so you'd have a two-second or three-second piece. How many ever images you wanted to make, that you photograph equally and then put together in a sequence of images and then that will be put in and put out uh, put together as a film so you'll have this one long film or relatively long for wet collodion of artists from the Americas, Asia and Europe all collabor collaborating on this one film and maybe have an exhibition if 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 uh, Greg gets that gallery open, and, and not not if, but he will, um, he's going to have a venue to support all kinds of work, and all and he'll be asking for uh, to do projects all the time. So that's just kind of the first one. The next one will be um, um, probably uh, more involved in your own personal work and doing group shows or individual shows, depending on. On, on where we're at. And that's what I want to do here as well and in Europe is open up these galleries to the Chinese artists so they can have exhibitions and work and show their work. Because I mean, seriously, that I mean, we need to see this work. We need to be involved in, in this kind of thing. And, and the best way to do it is to, to collaborate and to start sharing ideas and, and information. And really that's what my job is going to be is to try to facilitate and ask you all to help facilitate and get everything going so we can we can do these projects. Um, I will on on my personal on the personal note along that line. I am in the middle of writing a uh, letter, a brief, if you will, about the ghost dance work. And I thought I was going to show that in Europe first, but I think I'm going to show that in China. I think I'm going to have some some shows in China, the ghost dance work. So hopefully I can do that next year. So so maybe projects that. Uh, we, he's going to open up um, a collodion, a, a, a collective Chinese collective site, a site dedicated j just to the collective. And maybe what we can do is end up having these conversations about um, collaboratively about doing shows and exhibitions and, and exchanging work and ideas, and have areas to, to, to develop. And yeah, of course, some of them are going to be technical. I mean, I'm not going to stop talking about technical and that. You know, when it's technical, it's technical. When it's about the work, it's about the work. Just kind of compartmentalize those things. But we're going to be sharing all areas of the process, both technically, creatively, um, and and just socially, just to get 
to know one another and to get to know some different culture and, and, and ideas. It, it'll Influence is incessant. It'll inspire you. Believe me, it, it will inspire you. Um, and in this process, I think I think the Chinese um, will end up dominating. I think they'll I think they'll end up dominating not only wet collodion, but I think they'll end up dominating the whole thing. I think they are the future for sure. Um, we talked about uh, some workshops too. Um, that's another thing. We can talk a little bit about the technical right now. Uh, we'll move into talking about some negatives here in a minute, too. Where are we at on time? Oh, wow. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, so it's 11.30 here. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the, um, the workshops. We're going to... I'm going to... Um, I'm in the process of now um, getting the copyright and the ability safely for the Chinese to translate my books into Mandarin Chinese and uh, distribute those. So in six months or so, um, once the Chinese, I, I saw some, I don't know if you've ever traveled and done wet plate, and I don't mean take your gear and go out to the field or go up the mountains and make images. I mean like leave your house and go to another continent or country and use their stuff to try to make photographs, it, it can be challenging. Um, and the Chinese need some help there, um, a little bit of help. And so the, on the technical front, what we need to encourage and help them with, because I think we're a little farther ahead than them on that front, um, and some of, uh, some of it's due to accessibility of chemistry and those kinds of things, but um, once my book is translated, I think we'll have a better understanding of, of being more on the same page with one another on on what we're doing technically and why and how to achieve certain things that we want to achieve or not and um, and try to try to work through the technical try to work through the aesthetic try to work through the philosophical or the theoretical and then and then share 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 and I think this is the biggest um, th this is the most important message that I probably have this morning is to share the work um, and I'll just show you another Another uh, little bit of work here from the uh, in the book here from the academy. I think this is important, but yeah, the the, the presentation is so so wonderful. It's gonna ch it's changing me. I know that, and it'll probably change my my work quite a bit in in the con in the context of presentation for sure. Here's uh here's the in the academy book page in wet clothing. So. I guess you can see, culturally speaking, they're not that different from us that way, right? I mean, who doesn't love to see another human being? If, if, there, if China's about anything, it's about people, right? If you've been there, you know that. <laughs> it's about people. I mean, when you, when, you look at a, when you look at a city like Hangzhou of 10 million, drive to Shanghai, just a little northeast is 27 million, drive 1,000 kilometers north to Beijing, it's 37 million. In those three cities alone, it's a third of the population of America. Hey, there's Mr. Tony, the third Tony. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Well, uh, you're very old, sorry, I'm just disturbing you there. No, nobody's disturbing anybody in here. We're all good. Well, and it's a great, great show again, Tony. You look forward to the next time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, no, this is this is informal. This is uh, open forum. Anybody can speak or do or say anything they want as long as they're kind and not hurtful to people. And as I like positive things, I like positive, constructive things. So um, when I go into forums or boards where I see a YouTube's terrible, a uh, bunch of trollers, you know, trying to piss people off, saying nasty stuff. I I don't participate. I can't stand that stuff. So I just delete, delete, delete. You know and get rid of them. But no, this is an open forum. Everyone's welcome. Everyone's, um, um, you know, contribute and, and, and offer their opinions and information. I know I seem probably like a demagogue. I seem like I probably tower over everything, but I try not to. I don't want to. Um, but somebody needs to turn this computer on and get these things going, right? Motivate people to get on here. You're all going to be so much better off by, by being here and, and learning about this experience 
uh, and and then more importantly, being involved with the Chinese. That this is this is this is the most exciting thing that's happened to me in Collodian in 15 years, other than starting Collodian. Okay. No, I mean I'm serious. This is this is a this is a life changing. Not only in 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 the sense of making art, but connecting people and getting a breath of fresh air. God. If there's anything we need in Collodion now in the Americas and Europe, it's it's a breath of fresh air. We need that bad. I'm serious. Um, although I will say uh, the caveat, I was impressed with the the Greeley show with the Northern Colorado University of Northern Colorado. I appreciate you guys throwing work in there. Th those of you that did, I know uh, the other Tony. Um, uh, he got a portrait in there, and I can't remember who else got in there. But there were, I, I think that that show, I think I, I did a, a, a decent job. But uh, critics will, will tell me if I did or not. But thematically and informationally and, and technically, um, that's uh, <laughs> that's one of those things that uh, time will tell. But yeah, I uh, that man's enthusiasm I, in. <laughs> I am enthusiastic. It, 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 you know, it, you probably go back and watch some of the other videos and pro, oh, we'll have a big long up, uh, and then you pour this into that, and now I'm like China. You know, <laughs> I get it. I get it. I get it. It is. It does. It, it's. It's. How many things? How many? Check this out. How many things in your life? The birth of a child. Um, maybe a marriage. Maybe. Uh, um, you know. What do you mean, maybe? Would you care to amplify maybe a marriage? Uh, well, I, I don't want to speak for everyone. I, I want to be I want to be cautious about how I paint this scenario. <laughs> how many things in your life can you really say that fundamentally changed me? I mean, it's you're not going to be different to the outside world of parents, but fundamentally inside, philosophically, maybe spiritually. Um, totally about the inside, yeah. First. <laughs> totally. Um, this is this is also um, definitely about um, what's not seen. That's the most interesting thing about it to me. Um, the, the Eastern philosophy. I'm sure there's a lot more people here that, that know about Eastern philosophy a lot more than I do. I, I guess I I'm the typical bubbleized American, um, or sometimes I feel more European than American. Sometimes, but I'm definitely American. But sometimes I feel like in my little bubbleized American mind that um, that you know Eastern philosophies and you know I've known about them and everything. But man, until you go there and you're 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 in that and you're feeling that you're you're around that, you're smelling that, you're walking, you're touching, you're photographing, you're listening, uh, you're eating that wonderful food. Um, Oh, by the way, I ate like a madman in China <laughs> day, so much that I couldn't even fit another meat biscuit, and I lost three kilos. So there you go. That tells you something about the food, right? I never got sick. Never got sick. Yeah. I ate bugs off the street in Hangzhou. I ate um, duck tongue and beef lung and pig intestine and... I mean, I ate all kinds. Hey, welcome, Terry. Terry. There she is. Uh, Terry's on board. I'm glad to see some more faces in here. That makes me feel good. Um, so yeah, we never we never had any bad experience. Never got sick. And in fact, we ended up taking a bottle of Pepto Bismol, um, of course, right? Imodium AD and Pepto Bismol. Those are two things that um, I, I don't praise corporations often. But if you travel abroad, you might want something for those things. Um, we ended up giving that to Gray's wife, Zena. On the last night, we had a big leg of lamb and some plum wine that was quite strong. And Zena drank a little bit too much. And <laughs> had to hit the Pepto Bismol. So I was kind of funny, wondering. Okay, put uh, fill this cap for those of you that don't know what Pepto Bismol is. It's a it's a stomach or a coating, a a basic, a very alkaline coating for your stomach. It settles your stomach basically. And it's pink and it's thick and it smells like peppermint maybe or tastes like peppermint. And I can only imagine through those Eastern eyes, Chinese medicine, fill up that pink gooey stuff that tastes like peppermint. I, I, I can only imagine what she thought. <laughs> but we laughed it with him. So. And it did make her feel better. So yeah. not Mar many American medicines that are Western medicines that I would offer Chinese but because um, they have everything there. But 
Um, maybe the ginger root wasn't available available as easy as as the Pepto, but uh, the 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 plum wine that we drank in the country had uh, ginger root in it, though. So maybe they knew that it was going to make your stomach sick. And they had us at such nice hotels that we did we could even drink the water there if we wanted to. But we we stayed with the bottled water. Water, though. Yeah, the only we we were only in one place. We we changed houses. We we moved around about three times. We stayed in Shanghai, Hangzhou, inside of Hangzhou, outside of Hangzhou, and and so we moved around a little bit. The last one, every every hotel we were in had the the RO drinking spout water in it, which was very first world, you know, that kind of thing. So we never had any problems. But but um, going going back to that um, idea of of changing you or or modifying you um, and and the way you're thinking about your work and how you're making photographs. I think there's nothing better, and I know Terry's traveled a lot. I, I've seen on her Facebook page, and uh, and and Dale's traveled a lot. I know, and and Rob's been a, been around. I don't know uh, <laughs> the Tonys. I'm not sure. Uh, Tony, you live abroad right now, don't you? In France? Yeah, I live in the south of France. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that would be maybe like us moving to Wyoming, but still. It's a <laughs> <laughs> But, but the the idea here is is the more you travel and the more you see these different cultures, the more you're changed. And and Asia had a you know I've traveled a bit in my life and and Asia had the most profound experience probably because it was so radically different. You know I mean not only is it literally around the world, it's literally around the thinking and philosophy of how we live and operate and work and 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 I never ever understood the beauty and the dimension. Uh, thinking in the context of art, the way they think about art and how they handle art, and I just, I just think, you know, the Westerners, people in Americas and Europe, you know, you're doing yourself a great disservice in, especially in this little tiny window that we have. It's so difficult to get attention in photography nowadays. I mean, I think it was Chuck Close that said photography is the most difficult medium to to find your own unique style with. God, and if that's not true today, I don't know what is, and especially if you're working in digital or, you know, I was a photojournalist for many years. I saw the writing on the wall there. I got out of that game, and uh, I, just, I just knew that, you know, if I didn't pursue my own personal needs and desires to express myself, if I didn't have a supportive venue to do that, you know, it would be difficult. And this is the first time, going to China is the first time that I've felt like I've had a venue where I can make work and talk about work and people are interested in the work and vice versa I'm interested in their work even with a language barrier and actually have it make sense because uh, we have these walls up in, in the West somehow we have these oh I don't want to talk about my feelings you know and well maybe I don't want you to talk about your feelings either depending on what they are but you know when it comes to art if, if you're expressing yourself and you're, you're, you're really wearing your heart on the sleeve, let's use that idiom, you, you've got to be able to defend that work and talk about that work because people are going to challenge you on it, right? And and there just some some come so naturally. Um, yeah, very true. You know, photography is a universal language. I agree with that, Dale. And that that is that 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 transcends everything. I mean, you know, Stephen, I hope you're still in here, brother man. Um, mm -hmm. He translated so well for us that yeah. um, before he laid out any photographs, I, I found my, it was really interesting. Jeannie can um, attest to this. We we went to the we had this great big ceremony. They'll they'll sh they'll they'll send me the DVD. I'll post this stuff coming in the weeks to come. But they had and I don't know for you guys that have been in China, have you ever seen this? They had three young beautiful Chinese girls. I mean, they're maybe in their twenties. I don't know how old they were, dressed in white. Um, um, it, it's like. Uh, how would I say that? Uh, um, it looked like a, an Olympic, like an Olympic suit, like like how they carry the flags and they got their little Olympic suits on. They're they're cute and, and look good. There are four on each side and these great big panels behind us. You know, three four meter, meters tall and maybe you know twenty thirty meters long. And all in Chinese, of course. Wet plate, colony, and academic blah blah this and that or the other. Um, and and they opened the show up and you know they put us up in the line there and everybody the whole crowd was out there. I got a little tiny um, iPhone video that I just I just whipped around the crowd so we could see it. But um, it's it was interesting 
uh, it was interesting how um, this thing, I told you earlier that I wasn't completely sure what I was going to be doing. I just kind of went there on the fly. Uh, turned into this massive, like, daily celebration and ceremony, and there I am thinking, oh, my God, I just got off the plane two days ago, and I'm standing up here in this thing, and they're doing all this stuff. They open the show, and they introduce everyone, and, and I hand Gray this plaque that says the Colonian Collective Asia is officially open. The Academy is behind it, and we're having this celebration. We open the show. Everyone filed into the exhibition, and then we sat around the round table. But before we got to the round table, um, I started walking around and looking at all the work. And there were three venues here, three different venues of work, three different places, galleries. Oh, all within the campus. You just walk from one built one gallery to the other. But um, as I started walking around the work, I was looking at the work on the wall. All of a sudden, there was ten, then twenty, and then thirty, and then forty people, students behind me, just traveling in this big mass. And I felt compelled to start talking about the photographs. So I started doing this critique of the photographs on the wall and just started talking about what I thought about them. And, and you know, you walk up to that work and you see this one young man had, uh, had the, these, these uh, you guys know these bamboo chairs they make there. They're so beautiful and they have, they're so durable and bamboo is such an important plant or tree, whatever you want to call it. Um, He'd photograph these these very solid, grounded, wonderful objects in his culture with the very fra fragile, frail things like glass and and all these cultural objects. And they were photographed in this beautiful vignette that just blackened. And it was very you almost had to if you didn't have enough light on it, you might not even see an image there. And just just so beautiful and so well executed. I didn't even know who he was, you know. All this work, I, I really didn't even know who these people were. And and as I walked around and critiqued some of them, I knew. And again, I'll, a shout out to Christian, man. Good job, brother. That guy had some insect work. It was just oh. uh. And he'd cut, he'd cut it out. It, it, it reminded you kind of a microscope kind of slide. I probably would have added a little bit of microscope slide-ish feeling to it, but but they were just beautiful. Uh, they were kind of oval and they were different insects. And um, Cal had some beautiful portraits up there. Um, for those of you that know Cal, uh, he lives in Shanghai now. And, and so I was really impressed and, and got to talk about a lot of the work. And then the round table started and we were taken away and we sat down and had those conversations about um, why Collodion um, exists. I want to throw this question out and I want to get you guys involved. And I want you guys to throw something back and share with all of us, why do you, if you had to answer this question and you're sitting in a round table and you're having these conversations with people, which I love to do, that's my favorite thing in the world, they're having a discussion about photography and what it's about and why you use these processes or not and man, I want to beeline right, to, right there, I want to get in on a conversation. It's important to have these conversations because it informs me and it, and it, and it actually I'm, I, th I, I sometimes I think out loud. Sometimes I think uh, words that come out of my mouth inform my brain, if that makes sense. I don't, sometimes I don't think before I speak. Sometimes that's bad. But, um, so if I were to throw this question out to you, you're sitting in a conversation and somebody says, I don't think this process is valid and these are the reasons why. And they start talking about the danger, the difficulty, the, the uncertainty, the um, may, maybe even throw in the artifacts, um, uh, the problems with the images, um, quote unquote. How I'd like I'd like to throw this out there and have you guys respond to it. I'd love to hear your opinions on this. I'll mute myself and, and you, anybody that wants to jump in, go ahead. Well, I can start off first, Quinn. I mean, when you start going into um well, let's start with why, uh, why choosing the process. Uh, for me, I mean, I'm kind of in a parallel with you in a sense that, uh, well, my, your background is photojournalism. My background is, uh, is commercial, and which, you know, I've worked as a 
digital de ingestion technician. Um, I started off in the early 90s in which I was still working with film. And that's how I started. In well, college, I was Adobe 2.5, so we were still clipping and cutting. There was no layers yet. And it was always just kind of over there. And I was, I'm, so I'm 40, and I, but I'm still part of the film generation, in which that's what, that's what we learned on. You learned about zone systems. You started off in the basic darkroom techniques. And that was always my foundation. And when it came to digital, it began to become dominant. Uh, you know, like everybody else, uh, since I was still active in the, uh, in the commercial advertising field, it was, uh, I was like, okay, well, I have to make this change or else I don't survive. And so I was, and I did, and I learned on the fly with everybody else. But one of the things was when I started trying to do my own personal work again, it all felt, um, what's the word I want to use? Well, it just wasn't there. I don't know. There was something artificial about it that I can never connect with. Every time I did an image, I always found myself backtracking in which I was literally tearing the living hell out of a file in order to get the quality I wanted because I wanted that uh, that touch of film, that essence of film still there. Uh, and a, a friend of mine who's now in L.A. made a perfect comment. He's like, you know, we just want our, we still want our romance with film, as aloof as that sounds probably. <laughs> uh, why, why do you think, just interrupt real quick, I'm totally uh, on board with you, Rob. Uh, excellent. Um, why do you think, why is it, or is that just nostalgia? Why are we longing for that? Is it aesthetic? Is it, is it a look and a feel? Is it, is it nostalgia? It's like, oh, I just, I'm just waxing nostalgia. I just, oh, I just love the old days. And it was just so, I knew it so well, and now this computer crap, I can't get it. What, what is it that made you long for that? Well, I mean, I'll be the first to say, when it comes to the quote-unquote computer crap, I'm actually very good at it. I'm very proficient in Photoshop. Uh, when it comes to operating digital systems, I've worked with some of the more higher-end equipment. And it just feels very sterile to me. And also, I have to have a personal connective, uh, connection with something. Uh, to go back into the dark room, I mean, I can see the pros and cons of both digital and also working uh, in, well, let's say, an analog concept. A uh, very good example I can make is an architectural photographer I used to work with. Um, Back in the early 90s, he was uh, he did a photographic series on uh, Père Lachaise Cemetery in, uh, in France. And he uh, shot all 4 by 5 uh, black and white. And he had the negatives for many years. And when he came back to States, those negatives sat. He had a wife, a family, um, he owned his business, and he never had time to get into the dark when digital came around, we were using with a flex graft or flex type. I can't remember what it was called. Uh, four by five scanner, and we were still shooting analog film for all of our architectural products and scanning it in because digital wasn't quite there yet. And what it, for him, it opened up a new a went new venue. He was able to be in his office, have these uh, parallel shade images scanned, and work in a digital darkroom. And if his uh, youngest son at the time was maybe, you know, seven or eight, came into the room and needed something from his dad, he can just get up and go do it. Well, in a dark room, you know, you're in the middle of print, you can't. So I can see the positive of that. But for me, I needed that connectivity. I needed, I like the handcrafted process. Yeah. You know, part of me is in there. Yeah, I think I think to your point, that's a very good point. I often say this, and you probably heard me say it in the workshop, Rob. <clears throat> I believe Americans specifically. Um, I, I don't want to speak for North America or South America, guys. So forgive me if I'm misquoting that, because I know we have both in the in the group here. Um, but in America, uh, specifically USA, we just don't make things anymore. We just yeah, don't. We go to the we store. We don't, yeah, exactly. We don't make things anymore. So what happens is we've lost, and that's why I ask you about nostalgia. You know, we've lost, um, we've lost a lot. And what I think we've lost with that, because we don't make things anymore in this country, and if it's true in your country, maybe this will resonate. I think because of that, we we've, we've separated ourselves from 
holding things, having the object in our hands, being able to physically open this up and being able to turn an image and hold an image in your hand, right? The object is so important. Um, we've lost that relationship. And I think that's a big part of what we long for. A lot of times I think that's a big component of the drive uh, in this process uh, is, is uh, I often say it's like a, a ritual going back to religion. It's a re religion or religion. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a ritual or a ceremony to, to do this process. And everyone here knows that. Everyone that's worked in this knows that. You get this. You get in this zone. I've got this book over here in my library by this Russian author. Um, I can't pronounce his last name, but it's called uh, it's called uh, flow, the flow, getting into the flow or the zone, right? Where you just like you're there. Time does not exist anymore. Think about how many times in your day or in your life, in your week, in your month, in your year, how, my, how whatever it might be, that you can actually say that I lost time, I lost track and didn't care about time, didn't care about food, didn't care about anything, right? That, that ritual or that ceremony and, and that end result can drive you to that excellence. And, and that's what I mean when we, we've lost our relationship with the artifact or the object. We, we don't hold things anymore. They're all zeros and ones. Oh, look at them on my, you know, we do this thing. Oh, Look at look at it here, you know. Well, I shouldn't do that. Um, look at it here. Well, this is what I always do. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just it's just a ton of Facebook posts. Uh, people. Oh, we, just zip, we just zip through. Yeah, that's what I have on my phone now. So <laughs> we all, yeah, we always just flip through them, right? We take our phone. So we're never handling these. We're never even showing them in a you know the object. So to your point, Rob, I think whether we know it or not or whether we can articulate it like people whether we can articulate it or not is a whole other story people often say to me or ask me the ones that are forward with me say how man how did you find your passion how did you get so like on fire for something i don't know what i'm doing i'm i'm over here in this warehouse counting nuts and bolts because it pays twenty eight dollars an hour i don't really want to do that and, and I said, yeah, you didn't grow up wanting to count nuts and bolts for $28 an hour, did you? No, I wanted to be this or be that, you know. And I, w I was always curious. People don't naturally find that. But just like this, if we're not clued in to why we long for something or why we think about something a lot or why it means so much to us, if we can't articulate that, we can't express those ideas. And it, it's a piece of the work the piece of the information that supports the work that's missing that means a lot to the work. And I think by losing that relationship, you found something physical and tangible. You're making stuff with your hands. You're moving around. You're cutting glass or aluminum. You're screwing up plates and pouring stuff. Like, you know, you're, you're doing all this stuff that's going, that's part of that work. That's part of the artwork. That's part, that's imbued, that's infused into the work and that's important and when we can't articulate that I think we lose part of the intention of the work why do you long for that what is it that you desire why do you just love to get in that dark room back there and just make plates or watch that plate come up and just your heart I still get shivers my heart still melts when I see some plates come up you know it just never ever ends and that's the fire and drive we have to have to make good work that's what I saw in China I saw that in, in by the droves, and my, I mean, I saw more passion and motivation and dedication and hard work in China than I've seen any Americans or Europeans, Spanish and a little bit of the French maybe, um, come through. I mean, um, and, and some Americans. I, I don't want to throw everyone under the bus here, Rob. You've, you've done amazing stuff. Um, but the, the idea here is most people can't articulate their passion because they can't begin to articulate what they're drawn to and why they're drawn to that. That's, that's the stuff that informs the work. That's why you're making the work. If it's about the ritual and the process, let's talk about that. Let's get that out there. Let's tell people why that's important to you. And maybe it is um, working with your heads. I've got, I'm going to, I showed Jeannie nine minutes of my video last night together for, from China. Um, I just switched gears radically here. I apologize. Um, but um, in part of that video, a lot of that video 
if you watch that video, I shot a lot of slow mo, 240 frames per second, uh, of detailed stuff that you you would never look at if you're there. Maybe not. Jeannie told me this last night, and even after she watched it. Um, and you can you can talk about it, Jeannie, if you want. But what I photographed there were things that I w I was drawn to, and. And when I got home and I had a chance to look at it and think about it, I realized I am drawn to water and shapes and the synergy between movement. How mo Everything in Asia to me now feels like it's all in sync. Everything's moving perfectly. Well. Even if it seems chaotic, you know, the yin and the yang, everything seems to be moving. And that video reflects my exact feelings of what I saw and how I felt about what I was seeing, which words can never do. And I'll publish the video at some point if Jeannie lets oh, me. It's going to be really great. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. But so back to your point, um, that ritual is, is very important to the work. And I want to add one more thing. Um, when I photographed some very difficult people to photograph in my life, especially the portraits from Madison Avenue. I grew up with a, a young man named Michael Berry. Um, he was gay. I grew up with him since he was five years old. The, this whole thing about you're not born gay is complete bollocks. Um, I watched, and I'm going to try not to get emotional here, but I watched him go through some really bad stuff. And um, 30 years later, I got to photograph him. He has AIDS, HIV. And I photographed him, and he's in Portsmouth Madison Avenue. And... Yeah. That was a complete coincidence. You, you, you didn't look him up or anything. He found you. Right, right. Or um, through, through a friend, even. Yeah, through a friend. And, oh, I know Quinn Jacobson. I grew up with him, you know. So um, <laughs> I, 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 it was really interesting when I sat down with him before I photographed him. Um, I said, uh, I had a conversation with him, and I said, man, I said, I've got to ask you this because I can't photograph you if you don't answer this, this question for me. We, had, we were having coffee. And he said, yeah, what? And I said, I've got to know, uh, you know, when we were young, did I treat you bad? Did I, did I talk bad about you? And I hope he wasn't lying. You know what he said? He turned to me and he said, you were the only one that ever stood up for me. I said, oh, my, my heart melted. I, I said, I hope you're not just saying that. And, and I think he's true. I think it's true. But, but peer pressure when you're young is terrible. We all know that, right? So even if your heart or your mind doesn't feel something because you feel the pressure from your, your friends to do something, you, you get in on these cruel things. Especially when you're that young, and you know, 30 years ago or 40 now, I guess. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Slow those decades. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's, it's true. It's true. And so I asked him that, and he answered. I, I, I just... I just said, oh, please, I hope, I hope you're not lying. But, but I, I, I have to say that I want to believe that just because I, I want to know that I'm true and authentic to myself. But, but my father taught me, you know, always taught me to, to – he considered himself an underdog. And being of Jewish heritage and, and having his grandfather tell him to never talk about being Jewish, never, it's bad news, you know, and that's why I have all this stuff on my arm. Um, <laughs> That's a direct result of that, by the way. Um, I always felt that my father told me, you know, root for the underdog. Do it. And I have. That's what I've tried to do because I'm an underdog. That's, We're all underdogs. We're all somebody's life. life. Yeah. <laughs> right, right? I mean, we just have, some of us have specific stories that we can tie to it. Others don't. But we're all underdogs. We're all someone else's other. But my point is this, and I have a habit of doing this. Um, when I photographed Michael Berry, it was a wonderful experience. I made a dip a triptych of him, uh, frontal aside, and then I had him I had him bring some important stuff to to the uh, to the uh, shoot, and he brought a handful of, of medication, five thousand dollars a month of medication for his HIV AIDS, and I photographed him with that, and a positive magazine I think he had or something, and I photographed him with that. But my point is this. Sometimes the photograph, the glass or metal plate or print or whatever you're doing, sometimes the photograph isn't the art. It's the residue from the experience that you had with that person. I don't know any other process 
any other process that will give you that potential to create art with another person and have that exchange and interface in a deep and meaningful way and I really believe that's where the art happens and this plate is kind of the residue of that I don't know of any other process that will accomplish that speaking of ritual and ceremony I've had people in my dark room Jeannie can attest to this I've had people in my dark room that cry when they see the photographs uh, uh, you know and at the exhibitions they cried too yeah I, yeah I had a couple of people in China moved as well yeah um, so so if you get to know a person's work and the context of their work is so important and that's what I that's what I want to do that's what I've always tried to do maybe it hasn't come across quite right over the interwebs and and how I write or how I speak or I'm really quite a nice guy I'm a I'm a big bear really I'm not I'm, yeah. Oh, I know firsthand. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> well, those of you out there that have met me know that I'm nothing like what I read about myself on the interwebs. But no, I, it's it's you have a problem with the uh, with internet presentation nowadays, though. At least, yeah. uh, in my opinion, is basically because there has been a de-evolution in communication, which no one wants to read anymore. I and mean, we're dealing with now a proto language that is in uh, texting and whatnot. And yeah. sorry. I do, but anyway, I no, absolutely true. But, uh, but now, I mean, I've been doing a little bit of research, uh, and I've been noticing a lot of art, um, people who um, I can't think of the word I want to use uh, advise uh, artists about you know getting their work out and everything. Is the fact is one you have about roughly 15 seconds on a website to grab someone's attention and hold it. And if you don't get that 15 seconds, they're just going to pop over the next page. And one of the things as photographers we have to fight with is, Brad, yes, uh, there's a lot of times, you know, an image will always, you know, can stand on its own. Yeah. But there is always, you know, why we did it, there is personal context. And it's trying to grab that person, get them to actually read the, well, be, I guess we'll say our personal artist statement. Yeah, yeah. I, and people don't want to do that anymore. Now, and I have basics. Uh, my niece is what twenty now, and I know I deal with her a lot and her friends. And uh, I'm grateful to my niece. <laughs> my sister and I beat the living hell out of her, in which basis she loves books. Yeah. But a lot of her friends, I mean, getting uh, the younger generation to actually take the time to sit down and read something that is more than 140 characters. Yeah, yeah. It's really pushing it nowadays. There, there's a there's a book by Nicholas Carr, write this down, Nicholas Carr, C-A-R-R, -R, called The Shallows. Read that book, The Shallows, how the internet has rewired our brain. It's, it's honest to God, one of the best books um, on this topic that directly relates to photography. I recommend two books, Empire of Illusion by Chris Hedges and Nicholas Carr, The Shallows, how the internet rewired our brain. Those two books, in essence, and they're tiny, you could read them in a day, uh, those two books, in essence, will cover everything that you're talking about, Rob, and shed light on why people in the industry of art and photography are having such a difficult time today. But go ahead, I digress. Oh, no. That, for that rant, that was about it for me. But, um, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Going back when we were talking about, you know, in terms of the, where this conversation started a little bit. Right. Okay. Yeah, you know, <laughs> go anywhere you want. Uh, well, no, also I think uh, another thing for me, and it actually relates to the whole internet thing, is I needed to slow down. I mean, um, when, uh, when I was first fighting with the whole digital nightmare, in which I could not, no matter what, I couldn't get my voice across like I used to back in film. And I had never had any experience in wet play. The closest thing I ever came to with 19th century was, you know, 20 years back when I was in college. I had a brief course in which I studied uh, just strictly albumin printing. Yeah, I, I did too. I, I did too. I actually made albumin prints in 1992. Everybody freaks out when they hear that, but it's. Hey, in 92, I was doing it in 96. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's, that's good stuff. Yeah, but and you know we're still uh, either building a pinhole camera or working with conventional film, and we processed it out. We used D19. We just made the sh we did the bulletproof nags. Yeah. And I remember uh, sitting in that class, and there was a couple of times the uh, instructor was like, 
you know, you're kind of going catatonic because I was just waiting for, you know, a print to come through off one of the UV printers. Because we had built, we had built our tra the traditional box with UV lamps and our We didn't have access to, you know, right. uh, the, well, the uh, graphic cards to use the, uh, what are they, arc printers, the carbon arc? Yeah, the yeah, carbon printer. yeah. Uh -huh. We had, you know, wooden box style. Yeah. yeah. And, after, and, you know, after college, I tried getting back into it, but getting the business started, it just always kept putting put in the back, putting yeah. in the back. I and, did the same thing. I, I, yeah, we're, we're paths are very similar that way. Yeah, but then when I hit my digital rut, I just wanted to start throwing everything, and I went back to that, and then while researching that, that's how I found the Collodium Forums. And, mm -hmm. I, and I got your very first book, and yeah. that's what did it for me. But it was all about slowing down. Not only in the sense of, uh, it was just getting away from instant gratification. <laughs> and that's a word I, this little phrase I use a lot. I think I drive my friends nuts. But it's just, I, I can't stand it anymore. Yeah. I like the idea, and I think uh, in the past you've even talked about this when you were doing your portraits. You made a comment about how, yeah, it slows down because you have that five minute span, you know, of prepping the plate and getting it sensitized, and we can communicate with our sitters again. Yeah. I mean, intensely, intensely, intensely in that moment because things are hanging now. And, and, and the atmosphere, the whole vibe has, has raised. Everything, especially for that first image, everything. Um, um, yes, yes, Terry. Yeah, you can. Get in there, Terry. <laughs> can you Please even hear me? Say, Rob, yeah. shut up. Yeah. Sound great. Yes. Oh, please. okay, great. Well, it's really funny. I'm listening to this conversation, and it, it just, first of all, um, you and I have a, a very similar background because I was in photojournalism for years. And I actually started out, you know, in the film time, too. And we worked in a dark room. We made our prints. We made our deadlines. We pro I processed film in the backseat of my car in one of the dark bags. And yeah, yeah. I don't know if you remember all those days. Oh, yeah. But absolutely. I was in the generation where I only got to do that for about five or six years. And then I went on to, um, you know, digital was just beginning and it was like the early 90s. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I had to learn it because I knew I was going to be of that generation. And I mastered it. And I was able to set up a, um, you know, my, I actually started freelancing. I left my job at the newspaper and I started freelancing. And I worked for the New York Times and the Boston Globe from my house because I bought one of those Polaroid Sprint scans. Yeah, I and I used that. to scan, <laughs> I'd scan the negatives in. I'd run down to CVS. I had a deal with them. They'd process film. I'd yeah. run home and I'd scan them in. So I did it and then. I just like raked in all the work in the area and I did very, very well for years. Good for but you. I saw because I got to work in a dark room, you know, and, and I had that all that experience and I still have a dark room, you know, that and I watched where it was going, but I started seeing something happen. I was like, I better do something because this is not going to last forever. What? It was happening too fast. I made too much money too quick. <laughs> Why am I glad I saved my money? That's all I can say. That's I am great. glad I bought my house 24 years ago. Nice. I'd be in that's trouble. You. That's, but, a, that's a way to use that technology. I think oh, yeah. that, that is a wonderful story about using the technology but not being personally satisfied under the, the other than the was. Yeah. Well, and what ended up happening was um, I started, I went, I was like, this isn't going to last. So I went back and I, I went back to school and I got my MFA in photography. Nice. And then, and that was in 2003. And by the time I finished that degree, I, the, the, the work started to dwindle. So I had like a 10 year success rate of, you know, being published all over the world in yeah. journals everywhere just and from just, from yeah. Turner's Falls, Massachusetts. It was yeah. just amazing. Yeah. But now what I find, you know, I started teaching in 2003. Oh, I mean, and I started, I started thinking, hmm, one of the things I'm starting to notice is that uh, everybody that I know, I taught at Hallmark Institute of Photography for a year. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I left there after the year. I was so happy to leave. One of the things that was so difficult was they they really encourage students to, like, just shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. You can't miss your shot. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I first of all, editing is one of the hardest things you have oh. to learn how to do. I don't know how many people have, you know, three billion photos in their, um, you know, in their archives. But I'm a professional, and I don't have even close to that because I learned the art of editing. Yeah, good for you. Okay. There's an art there. So then the next thing is, um, as I'm teaching, I'm looking at the work coming through, and people are just getting satisfied with mediocre. 
Yep. And everybody, they're not used to seeing quality anymore because everyone has a phone and the kids do the Snapchat and, of course, all the selfies of the big lips going, yeah. you know, it's, if I yeah. see one more of those or one more of somebody photographing themselves in a bathroom after they put makeup yeah. on, I'm going to scream. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what people are used to when they put those, those are their portraits now. It's yeah. like, really, that's a portrait? Yeah. So I teach right now, I'm teaching for the Art Institute of Pittsburgh and I teach online. And oh. my students the level of quality of students, what's happening is I'm seeing when I ask them to do portraits, that's what they're doing is they're photographing their friends doing the big lips thing, you know, doing the butt sticking out, doing this, doing, you know, it's like all this, I'm like, where are these kids learning that this is a portrait? Facebook, huh? Seriously. Yeah. So, so I have realized that one of the biggest problems is this, um, um, I don't know, the guy who was just talking before me, Rob, um, Rob. Rob, Rob yeah, he, mentioned he, the in instant Chicago. gratification. Yeah. That is my pet peeve because if you do anything fast, it's not going to last and is not going to be quality. And what I started, think it is like throwing a turkey in a microwave. You're going to yeah. get something tough. And it's gross. You cook it for hours conventionally, yeah. and you've got the meat, you know? Yeah, I, yeah, I always say I, that's a great analogy. I always say this to add to piggyback on that real quick. I always say, would you rather receive a handwritten letter or an email? Or would you rather re would you rather do a microwave burrito exactly. or go over here to the Casa de Sol, the real Mexican food? And get exactly. Food? Well, it's true. Yeah. Anything, just, anything, oh, I'm sorry. No, I just have to jump in uh, for a second, guys. I, I, I agree with everything that's being said here because, uh, believe it or not, I'm a little bit older than you, Terry, and I. <laughs> we have, I have we, our generation now does not know and has never shot film, and I find that sad. It is sad. Uh, yeah. Now, having said that, Quinn, I just uh, speaking of uh, of uh, of quality, I have to keep the quality in the abode. I'm being summoned. Uh, and if I know it's in my best interest, I will uh, uh, follow those marching orders. So, uh, having said that, I want to thank you guys. It's been it's been another great couple hours and a bit, and I look forward to it again. And Quinn, I'll talk to you a bit more uh, later. I hope because I want to learn if you uh, had any success setting up your wet plate uh, gear on uh, Ninjang Road in uh, Shanghai. Oh no, no, I didn't. But 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 we'll talk about those. And thank you, Dale. And and let's get you involved in this uh, collective in Asia. And thank you for joining us. And and we'll do this again next month. And I hope you can enjoy uh, join us. I look forward to it. Thanks, guys. Have a great chat. Have a great, great afternoon. Thanks. Back, great to, back to you, Terry. Okay, so so what I finally um, started thinking about was when it, what I get from my students, I, I tell them they need to shoot, give me a contact sheet with 36 images. Yeah. What I get is 36 images of almost the exact same thing. And I have to go through and it's like, you know, I got one that's a little darker. You know, clearly what they're doing is, is taking a bunch of photos with, and just of the same thing and turning it in. And I was thinking how when I started and I went to college, you know, back in the whatevers, and um, <laughs> and I had, I would be given a roll of 36 and I was told, give me a contact sheet with that. And I was going to be critiqued on the quality of that. So here's my trick for anyone, anyone out here else teaching? Does anyone else teach on here in this room? Um, I'm not seeing anybody, uh, but, well, but in the chat, there could be a whole bunch in the chat. This is going to resonate. If you if you look at people's photos and you know they're just snapping away, you'd go and get it. Somebody does a wedding photo. I used to do 300 weddings, you know, 300 photos, and now they're doing like 5,000 and they're handing, handing these clients like 1,000 images, and it's overwhelming a client. Who uh, wants to see that, you know? No, yeah, I didn't so, know that. So when my students now, if, if I need to get back into a, a, um, a ground college. I mean, I, I like what I'm doing, but I've, I've been looking for a ground college to teach in because this is driving me nuts. I'm dying to get in there and say, you know what, I'm, on, I'm switching from, you're going from the dark room, now we're in digital dark room, and you guys don't know what a dark room is because you've never worked in one. Yeah. So what I want is 36 composed completely different composed images on mm -hmm. one contact sheet and then I watch them try to fool me and then I say send me your metadata yeah so now I require metadata showing on that contact sheet because what's happening is nobody is thinking anymore yeah. nobody is taking their camera and they're not looking through it they are not composing carefully an image and that's why we're losing quality and that's why that's the respect sad. of artists is getting 
kind of um, obsolete uh, around yeah. here. It's, it's not. In, in you're, you're, you're right, Terry. It's trashed. And, and, and to your point, looking at that exit data or looking at that data, you know that, that by cropping an image in or zooming it and cropping it down and changing this and flipping it or do whatever they do to it, uh, you're right. I think uh, I think the bottom line is that those the kids that are or the young people or the people that are and they're not necessarily young anymore um, that are doing that are really losing out in the sense be, of of making thinking about making the photograph and only thinking that that's post production everything now that's post production that's post production well yeah I guess if you're if you're doing something that you don't really care about and that's why like Rob talked about the commercial aspect and we have photojournalist backgrounds and, and 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 those kinds of things and photojournalism to me was not noise it was it was a serious thing that I took very seriously that turned into something else that I saw the right wall in the early 90s and it turned into more about advertising and commerce and I didn't want to I always felt the photography for me was a personal thing always the 30 years that I've been doing it and even before that, even as a young kid, when I dabbled in it around the house, I thought it was serious. So, mm -hmm. so I've never not taken it seriously. But right. for the young people now, if they're, <coughs> they're only taught, and correct me if I'm wrong, I've had some offers to teach at places. I've taught in higher ed before. Um, I don't get along with the politics of those places very well. So, yeah, I have an MFA. I, hear you. <laughs> I do all that stuff. Yeah, it's tough. So, but, but the real bottom line here, I think, is that if, if the passion isn't there and they don't, they think it's just, that they only teach, correct me if I'm wrong, but to my knowledge, they only teach, and I'm trying to get change this a little bit through my little bubble, but they only teach to be a photographer, you'll do commercial work or you'll do some kind of form of money-making work rather than like, so it's completely off the dockets. If you if you talk about oh I want to be an artist and I want to make uh, fine art photographs, my personal expression of ideas, questions, comments, however you define that, they don't really teach that anymore. And our culture is telling them that you need to make that great living. You need to make that a lot of money. You need stuff. You need more. You need the right shoes and you know for the duck lips and the big butt. You need to be wearing certain things. To it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's it's actually become almost a joke, and I think that the one thing I don't know if you know um, you've noticed uh, I have a professional page um, on Facebook as well as my my regular page. But what I've done is um, I'm almost embarrassed to call myself a photographer, yeah. and so I have actually switched it. Um, my page used to be Terry Capucci Photography, and I've switched it to Terry Capucci Photographic Artist, and it, all of my business cards are going to reflect that I'm a photographic artist yeah. because somebody with a digital camera throws a few great photos on Facebook and the next thing you know they're like do you guys like this business card design I'm gonna start a business and yeah. it's insulting to somebody like us who's spent our life living and breathing yeah. um, you know photography and reading and understanding the history and touching the stuff and and somebody I don't think you should be allowed to call yourself a photographer if if you've never worked with film or you've never worked with in a dark room and made the process it should be against the law <laughs> you know what? On that on that segue, I'll tell you something. That's a very good point. And I totally agree with that. And I'll give you a bit of history that you may or may not know about. In the 19th century, you were not called a photographer unless you made negatives and prints. That's awesome. You were called an ambrotypist or a tintypist. It's basically calling someone today. I call them pixelographers. It, that's it, that's a good one. Yeah, pictographers. Because because let's look let's look at the history real quickly. Uh, Sir John Hirsch, uh, MOT, member of the tribe, he came up with the word photography, right? Two Greek words, writing with light. Mm -hmm. Now look at the definition of photography. Those two Greek words in the dictionary today it talks about light energy hitting light sensitive material or or, or, or ref, you know the light sensitive. Re material responding to that light energy. Well, the only light energy that you have, a charge couple device is not light energy. That Those are zeros and ones that are transferred to a CF card or a hard drive or something else. The emulsion of a film, silver halides, halogens right. are light sensitive. So if you want to get down to the brass tacks and if you really want to talk semantics and you know split the hair, so to speak, you can't really call 
digital image making photography. You have to I call agree. it pixelography or something else. Do I have anything against it? No. I, the only thing I have against it is what everyone's spoken about uh, this morning uh, about the idea of when I have 15 or 20 students from UC Denver or UC uh, Boulder or Colorado University come through my darkroom, 15 of them in the darkroom, and I say, you know, ages ranging from 19 to 50, 60 years old, mm -hmm. raise your hand if, you, if, if you've ever been in a darkroom before. And, you know, one hand goes up, you know, out of 15. Right. People. And that's, yeah, that's, right. the, that's the old person in the crowd, so to speak, you know, younger than me, but the old person in that crowd. And so when we're losing this, and th th these are the questions, what does that mean? Like when I started this question at the roundtable, or I didn't start it, someone else did in China, but they were asking, what does this mean? Why does it mean this, and what is the future? Do you call yourself an artist or a photographer? I started calling myself an artist a long time ago, but it sounded really kind of, you know, elitist and weird, and when you're in public, you say, I'm an artist. Oh, what do you do? Oh, you know, you you smear feces on the wall and, you know. Do <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, right? Um, <laughs> But so that word conjured something else. But now, like Terry says, I do. I, 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 for years, I've kind of wanted to separate myself from photography. It sounds awful. But if you read my story in 2000 where I finally came to a decision of I've, I've lost, this is like a bad relationship. I can't handle you anymore, photography. We need to get divorced because we're exactly. not getting along. I'm not feeling the love anymore, baby. I, it's not there. I beg to differ because... Which, all you had was an iPhone 6, and you made all those images, and you're making a movie with it, and everybody's going to see exactly what we experienced through that. And because, and it's hard to explain, but you had like all these things coming at you, the, the flight, and the, uh, so there's jet lag, and, the, and meeting the people, and, and we had to, you know, navigate to these hotels, and and do all, and you had to do the conference and the exhibition, and all all these things were going on. But at the same time, he was getting these images on his iPhone six, and and it's amazing what what you got with that. And it's going to blow everybody away. <laughs> it's a really good point. Yeah, thank you, Jeannie. That's true. That that is a very good point. And so, how do I reconcile that with my ranting about if that's not photography? Um, well, I've got to admit, though, I, I, I have fallen, I've had a great affinity for the last 10 years for video work. I, I do love motion. I do love, uh, and when I post this video of China, it'll be kind of an abstract. There's a lot of slow motion. There's a lot of still photography. There's a lot of, yeah. So how do I reconcile that? When I just went on that rant and said, this, this technically can't be photography, what is it then? What am I creating or what, are, what am I doing? And I guess... I guess is the does the question matter? Is it relevant? I'm I'm not trying to answer anything necessarily. I'm I'm trying to ask things and just have conversations with people. Right. I can give my opinions, but uh, Janie just made an awesome point, and thank you for that. Very very kind. It was oh, a I've seen the movie. Uh, I just ranted about that, and now maybe some of you, when you see the video, you'll say, "Why are you in wet clothing?" I don't know. <laughs> had that happen before. No. You know, the, the final thing that I want to say about you know the, the actual question <laughs> that I yeah. never answered um, is one of the things that happens to me is I get a thrill that does not subside. It's it, every time I see a print, uh, I see a plate develop in front of me, and it it's it gives me a thrill that I used to have the first time I'd walk into the newspaper and I'd make my print or the, the every time I'd see a front page photo of mine I I'd get that, that thrill yeah. that I thrill that I haven't I it went away for years yep. and now I started this process about two years ago when I got your book and I I have wanted to do it my whole life it was an investment um, I found what works for me and I've developed a workflow and it doesn't matter what's going on the moment it starts coming to, to <laughs> life I start skipping and jumping like oh my god oh my god oh my god oh my god this is amazing and yeah. it's like you can't tell anybody they don't get it they're like okay yeah it's cool but it it's kind of dark and I'm like no that's the way it's supposed to look <laughs> yeah. they're looking they're looking for a real print and, right. and, and you know no this is the this is the real thing right. and it's gonna last it's not gonna burn in a fire right and it's, it's not, not gonna... going to get blown up on a computer yeah. it's not <laughs> gonna go from a, a media drive to a CD where it, it deteriorates over time right. this is gonna last forever 
Yeah, and and that's and how how where can you say that? What other work can you say that about? Really, um, I will throw this one. Slide. That's well said, Terry. Thank you for sharing that. I totally know that feeling. I have been there. I love it. It makes it makes life worth living. That those right. Did. And that I think that those are feelings of both. Um, it's a say. It's a satisfaction. It's a. It's an accomplishment. It's. It's. You feel. You feel verified. You feel. You know. So many times, guys. I'll. I'll say this. I admit this all the time. I feel like a fake. I feel like a fraud. I feel like. Oh my God. You know. This. What am I doing? I'm. I'm just. I'm just making this crap up. This is just a bunch of BS. And I really get down on myself. And I. I'm really hard on myself, actually. And. And those moments that you just described and articulated so well, I've experienced a lot of those. Uh, not enough, but but several of them. And I I know that feeling, and that's that feeling that all that work has come to fruition, or or I I am justified in in what I am doing. You know, I don't need other people to tell me that, but those are things that really do. I mean, I am a human being. I do. I, I fail at things. I'm not good at a lot of things. I try things. I I. You know, I make mistakes all the time, and and rather than thinking so negatively, I try to think positively. But I don't want to have a big inflated ego and all this kind of right. stuff if I can help it. But those are those are that's the satisfaction and the satiety of of I think of hard work and diligence. And I'll just make this one comment. Terry put some work into the the UNC show, and congratulations by the way. That was a beautiful photograph. Thank you. Um, and I didn't see anything. I, I I saw that this person that made this image. That um, uh, made this this particular photograph uh, had an eye, and and that's all I can say. It's a photograph of a barn with Show a bunch, bunch of foreground. Yeah, please, a bunch of foreground in it, and I could tell that an artist, that a photographer, it without ever seeing her name, without ever seeing anything about it. There it is. There, there it is. is. Beautifully oh, wow. composed, beautifully executed. Here, sorry, Terry. Let me there. Try that again now. Show. There you go. Look. Actually, just yeah. click on her. You'll it'll switch to her camera. There yes. you go. Beautiful. Is that working? I'm, I mean, I'm so proud of this one. And this is the last one that I did where I did that, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. <laughs> I was stood out in the middle of a field, and it was a couple days before Thanksgiving, and we were just, it was freezing out, but I knew I had to get, get out there, there with, the new, with my new dark box. There you and go. I, I did it, and I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God. And I knew I was going to submit it. That's and, awesome. And that's, it's a thrill. And that's and see that that right yeah and congratulations on that that's going to be a beautiful yeah. show and that right there shows and proves to you that 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 hard work and money and the time you spent into this created gave meaning to that material and created something that let's be honest um, well th these can be great and and or a di digital camera whatever you have. They're, they're the satisfaction, the level of accomplishment, the level of work. There, there's a reward that's given, and and you know Eastern philosophy will tell you this big time. There's a reward given for that diligence and hard work. When you're paid, um, I think Gandhi said he had these seven things that he talked about, and one of them was, and I'm paraphrasing here, one of them said, when you get something and you don't work for it, it means nothing. Absolutely. It's empty. So, so that that kind. Of, I take everything into context. I, ju I just I can't just look at a photograph. And I agree with what Rob said. Some images stand on their own. Some images are just beautiful. And let me give you a quick quick overview of how I deal with that. And you can respond to this if you'd like. Anyone who would like to respond, they're welcome to. When I go into a gallery and I see a photograph on the wall. There are photographs on the wall, and some of them are outstanding and beautiful, and well composed, executed beautifully. I don't care what the process is or isn't, or what the prints are or aren't, are, are or not. When I look at the photograph, if I if I can't, and Rob's correct about this, if I can't spend three or four minutes reading an artist statement, the intention about that work, why that artist made that work, what the intention behind that work was. If I can't spend two or three minutes reading that, and it should not be a bunch of art speak and bollocks and made up stuff. It can't be, oh, I felt lusciously gray in the third moon of Uranus. No, I'm not <laughs> buying any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, if it doesn't have some meat to it, and just brief, two or three paragraphs, right? If you go read my artist statements on each body of work, they're not going to take three or four minutes of your time. 
whether you like my writing or get my ideas or not, I don't know. That's that's up to you for you to decide. But the idea, if that statement isn't on the wall, or if that statement isn't available, or the artist isn't available to tell me about that work, I refuse to do their intellectual work. I won't do their intellectual work. I refuse to. If you don't have anything to say about this work, I surely don't have anything to say about this work. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, I can walk up to it and say, oh, God, that looks like a lake I used to go to as a kid. Oh, that gives me warm and fuzzy feelings. And 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 why did you make it? Well, oh, I made it because you might like it and it might remind you of a lake when you were a kid. No, they didn't make it for that. They made it because they were influenced by someone that thought it was sexy or cool or got a bunch of likes on Facebook or whatever it is. And it's all transparent and fake. And, and I, if I'm the one looking at your work, telling you about your work, and it's okay if I do after you tell me what your intention about your work is, I think that's great. I love to have that happen. But primarily, you're the creator. If the creator has nothing to say about the work, I don't. If I come up with my filters and I say, oh, yeah, that reminds me of this, and oh, it looks, you know, I can critique it academically. I can tell you what I see, what it means, the symbols in it, the lighting, the, the, the com composition, uh, the choices you made. Can you answer why you made all those choices? Why did you make that whole plate? Why are you using wet plate clothing? Why did you pick positives? Why did you pick glass or metal or whatever choice you made? Why did you choose that composition or that light or that lens? Do you know why you're doing all these things? Or is this just another mechanical thing we do throughout the day and punch the buttons? Though that kind of presence is what I felt in China. That kind of presence of not worrying about what's behind us or depressed or you know distraught about what's in back of us. We can't do anything. Not anxious about what's in front of us. We can't do anything about that. But being right here right now. That's all that matters. And when your photographs can feel that way and look that way, and you can talk about them and defend them like that, I think you've made art. And, and you just oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say they'll have to start putting audio in the galleries, and maybe you could have looping artist statements going while people are looking at the images, since they won't read anything. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, exactly. You but you know, the funny thing is, is what you just said. All those questions that you just threw out there, um, those are the questions that each artist needs to ask themselves when writing the artist statement. And sometimes you get stuck. It's like, I don't know what to write. And and I mean, I do. I mean, I have these fabulous projects, and it's like. I don't know what to write. And it's you forget to ask yourself those questions yeah. that you just asked. And those are key because and, you can't write it. Right. And you can't get hung up. Here, Here's what I do. And here, here I'm going to backtrack and contradict myself. I'll do this all the time. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to backtrack and say that's the most important thing to me. And then I get stuck. Why am I selecting whole plate? Why am I choosing to make negatives? If I can't answer that, those questions, I have to – take a moratorium. I have to stop and take a break until I can honestly answer those questions. Because right. the last thing I want to do is wake up in the morning and, and realize that I'm a fake or a phony. That's my greatest anxiety, that I'm, I'm being fake, that I'm, that I'm mm -hmm. oh, I heard this over here, so I'm going to do this now. And like, is that creepy? Is that really me, or am I just doing that? I, I got to, you know, I, it's, you can get hung up. So there's a fine line there. Uh, should you make work? Yes, I think you should make work. Is it okay to stop making work and think about these questions and answer these questions? I Absolutely. Hallelujah. Please. Because all you're going to do is add to the noise. And that's what happens right. to me, right? Rob talked about earlier, how do you grab someone's attention? How do you get that attention today? How do you do that? Well, when I started in Wet Collodion, that was the intention grabber. All I needed to do, I could photograph a pumpkin. And people thought I was... Awesome, uh, right? Or Avedon or somebody, right? And and so that process grabbed them. They, they just, ugh, it's like grabbing somebody by the throat. It just stops you. I called it temporal confusion. I called it like, oh my God, that's an old photograph. That sounds like a that great project. <laughs> temporal confusion. I can see a whole show coming with that one. <laughs> yeah, well, I think my, my entire body of work is really temporal confusion. <laughs> New book. <laughs> I used it in the beginning to grab attention because I, I knew this dilemma of how do you get attention, but I wasn't I wasn't prepared for the longing and the desire aesthetically in, in the general public to see something different. Oh my God! I mean, I could have made a body of work about anything and had it 
you know, I had more offers for exhibitions and publications and and work. I turned down crazy commercial gigs and all kinds of stuff. It was it's bizarre, but I've kept it pure and clean for me. This is one area of my life I won't allow things to mingle and get confused for me. But but I call it temporal confusion because you see this old photograph. I I was in a show in Vermont, graduate school, and I had. Um, I don't have them here with me. Um, I had a series of these of, of Nene or Rene, a guy that I photographed um, a lot like Kirby there. And I was standing there next to my my prints in this this uh, uh, gal, uh, this uh, professor or advisors we call them. Pr advisors walked up and she said, "Oh, these are interesting." I said, "Well, thank you." She said, "Where did you find them?" And I said, "Find." Fi I thought, "Oh, find him." I said, "Oh." Well, he's a he's a, a, a garbage man that I've I've worked with for a while, and he's he's got some mental issues, and he's got you know some some of these other things, and we talked I talked a little bit about his background. She said, "No, no, no. Where did you find the photographs? Did you, like, did you find them in an attic or something?" Or I said, "Find the photographs? No, I made the photographs. These are." And she looked at me and said, "What?" I said, "Yeah, I made the photographs." And so she was relating. This 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 kind of confusion about this contemporary subject in this old photograph, and it just the time didn't match. So it, it grabbed her by the throat, like it stopped it. I mean, you could watch people walk up, walk by other people's photographs in three dimension, and then they just stop. I mean, I realized quickly that I, that I was working with something very powerfully just visually. I could photograph anything, and it would grab that attention. I can go on Facebook now. Facebook is hilarious. I I can't hardly keep up with it, but it's hilarious. Uh, I can go on Facebook and see people posting images of pumpkins and, and like, 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 you know, and, and, and getting that kind of excitement from it. It's a good thing and it's a bad thing, right? When we're babies, we, we drink the milk, right? We, we're on our mother's milk, but we have to move on from that at some point. We have to get to the meat. And what I'd like to see us do collectively, and not me as anything in it, just part of it, I'd like to see us move beyond this kind of milk thing and, and grab the attention, not with just the process, but with the context and content and intention of the artist behind that work that just supports it even more, that just brings that work to a level, um, that aesthetic and the power of it and that attention-grabbing-ness of it um, use it. Use it to your advantage, I think, but but don't use it as a sole purpose. And I think that's what's happening today. We're using too, we're relying too much on the process and not enough on the content of it. And having said that, I just juried that show at UNC University of Northern Colorado. There, um, that will be a diverse show. We will have images in there from all over the world. Um, I don't, and I know the Mariana Gallery up there is beautiful. They're going to do a wonderful job of, of the exhibition. Everyone will get a catalog and, and all that. It's 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 top of the heap stuff. But that will be a very diverse selection. I curated that show not on the context of conversations like these, but on the conversation of educating the public and helping the exactly. public understand what these artists are doing, what they're using, and why it's important. So I tried to select artists that were both. Um, seasoned, uh, maybe not necessarily in the process like Terry or, or Terry's that way, but very good eye. You could tell immediately that this person has a wonderful eye, a wonderful execution of composition and seeing uh, a photographer, a photographer kind of essence, that, that photographic quality. So some of them weren't very long in the process, others were old veterans. Others I, I realized afterwards and I saw all the names and all the connections. I, I saw, oh my God, you know, I picked Harry Taylor stuff I've been working with for years, beautiful work. I, I tried to select a diverse group. Uh, so I could a attack that question of how do you get people's attention. Mm. Well, when they walk into this wet plate show, yes, they'll see Terry's beautiful little 4x5 barn, but they'll also see a silver gelatin print next to it from a wet collodion bright negative right. or uh, or a, a carbon print from Slovenia or uh, you know we'll, we'll, we'll have the spectrum I tried to keep the general public in mind because really that's part of our jobs Absolutely. Uh, Terry teaches and other people teach formally but part of our job is to help educate the public on what this is and why we use it and, and, and go from there and that's kind of the, the temporal confusion rant but getting attention is tough
I did want to make one. I want to make one comment. Um, I don't know how much longer you're going, but I want to make sure that people understand that I'm not anti-digital. I work in digital. Me too. I love digital. Digital Me has too. its place. There is no question. I work with video. I work with digital when I'm doing. You know, if I'm out doing a documentary project, um, most of the time, you know, and I, I just did the Amish recently. I was shooting digitally with that. I wasn't shooting five thousand photos of the same thing. I might shoot two of the same thing and yeah. kind of move on, but. Um, I, I, there's a place for it yes. and there's hobbyists and I don't want to make a hobbyist um, feel like their work is not valid because it is valid. Me too. Yeah. And I want to jump on that boat with you Terry. I, want, yeah. I, I usually I always preface everything I rant about like this with that I am not anti-digital. It's a exactly. different. It's different. It's but I have to this. reiterate that a digital in the hands of a master is different than a digital in the hands of a student. Very much so. <laughs> and that's where you and that's where you differentiate between a hobbyist yeah. and a professional. And I don't even like to use the word professional when it comes to me because I do consider myself to be an artist. Yes. Um, and there is a really big difference. And that's why a photographic artist is now how I go about identifying myself because I shoot with all different mediums. I work with Polaroid. I work with um, film. Yeah. Um, digital now wet plate and of course now I'm I'm dying to get into making um, negatives and with with this because the last time you did this you talked about how you're going to want to go past it and of course that's been in my head and now I've got all these plates sitting here going I need glass <laughs> so, yeah, and, and, it's your fault but I'm yeah, going to use yeah. up my metal first <laughs> there you go. well good yeah and that, that's awesome that's a great big plan yeah uh, first of all I didn't know that I'd rant for uh, or that would have these conversations for uh, three hours, but but at the same awesome. time it's good. And I would have I would have gone. You saw my last item here, at Negs. I didn't quite get to that, but we will do that. And I think the next time I'll I'll reverse it. I'll do a little bit, a little piece on China in the front, literally maybe 30 minutes, and then do the rest making negatives. And we will do that. Um, I think that's the next evolution. And I think that's the. the I wanted to throw out there, though, it's interesting. We talk about this instant gratification, and I'll, I, we're only going to go about 10 more minutes, but I'll leave you with this. And I'll, maybe I'll even try to pull up a little clip of my China video. Speaking of video, I'll maybe try to play it. Um, I'll leave you with this thought. Instant gratification, terrible word, right? We hate it. But let me draw a connection that you would eventually draw have you, had you spent multiple years in this, and maybe you've drawn this conclusion. I don't know. We'll see. Um, instant gratification means that um, digital satisfies that. Boom, 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 phone or camera. I've got a, a Nikon and a Canon over there, and I got all the fancy glass, and I got all that. I do all that stuff, right? Um, and I make money with it, and it's a good thing. Um, but it, the, the funny thing about it is, is instant gratification. Now, I'll just do that in Lightroom. I, you know, oh, boy, look at that. I got that, you know, whatever. But then we talk about collodion, and we talk about slowing down. And you're right, we, do. we slow down. But what's the most attractive thing of all? Watching that instant gratification of that image come up. That's appealing to that instant gratification that we desire and need. Yet we're working in this other process. So feedback or instant gratification, uh, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to that, but I am opposed to not thinking about that. That's, I think that's the differentiating point. Mm -hmm is that when you make an ambrotype or a tintype or a positive image in collodion, you've actually thought that out, at least to the length of, oh, I got this light, I've got this composition, I've got this purse, whatever it is, I've got these developing times in this chemistry. At least you've thought that much out. Today what we're dealing with is instant gratification in a very different kind of damaging way, if you will. So um, let me see if I can pull up just a bit of that video. Yeah, you want to I would love to see it. <laughs> I, I was going to share. Even um, if it's digital. Yeah, it is digital. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's all digital, right? Let me see screen share. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I was going to talk a little bit about these, but these this is just the the, the, the diptych that I made in uh, over in China there. And I this, love this. Oh, thank you. This is a Chinese symbol for happiness and prosperity on the right side, the diptych on the right, or the image on the right there. Both eight by ten um, black glass ambrotypes, and this was hanging on Gray's wall. This is an old fisherman's um, uh, raincoat and hat, and this is what they'd go out and wear to go out and fish in. And I got to see the shoes later, but um, yeah, I like uh, I like that. Um, let's see if I can. And and they they immediately kind of were like people were like getting into the 
wanting to buy these things. But again, you know, Western eyes, and they were from from Europe. I think it's going to end up yeah. in Europe or sold in Europe. They'll edit this diptych will end up in Europe, I should say. Okay, let's see if I can share this China video. Just or at least a minute or two of it. I'll share a couple of minutes of it and then we'll call it good. Let's see. Come on, quick time player. Here we go. Let's see if I do that and then I say escape and I minimize this and I say Google Hangouts and I say screen share and I say Google hang entire screen yeah yeah I'll do entire screen share I know it's gonna flip out on you here hold on right looking good okay how about that there it is there you go you enter full screen let's see if I can play any of this Guys, hear the music? Yes. Yeah. It's a little yeah. bit choppy. But. Yeah. Is it? Okay. Key is the most important thing in their culture, I believe. So what I did is I went with themes of the tea in the water and the West Lake and now kind of the pounding of all the just the different thematic feelings that I had about like what I was seeing and what they were doing. That's a meal in the Buddhist temple. It costs uh, five of us 60 cents to eat. Wow. 60 American cents. Of course, this is just the first draft. You see Mr. Wu on the left photographing me, photographing. <laughs> I had two people doing still photographs and video of both of, of, all the time there, the whole time. That's moth shit tea. <laughs> tea that's processed through insects and very expensive. Leg of lamb. There's our good friends. Yeah. That's Mr. Gray, Zena, and Kylie there. Snaps. A little stamps. There's Master Wong. He's the greatest calligrapher, the most popular calligrapher in China. Oh, that's pretty. 
Yeah, they're just beautiful scenes. My my new favorite food. <laughs> wow, awesome. Zena, Gray's wife, sweet lady. Mm -hmm. These are baskets that you'd fill up out of freezers or cold places and then cook it for you. I was fascinated with the food. I'll stop it there. You get the idea. Yeah. Isn't it awesome? Great. It's wonderful. I love it. Well, thank you. Now I want to go make a video. You need to stop doing this to me. So he was, <laughs> he was doing this the whole time, getting these beautiful shots and beautiful foot, film footage and doing everything else all at the same time. I just can't believe it. <laughs> yeah. Great. You know, China... Uh, it, China did inspire me on, on many levels. You'll see it coming out um, even in my ghost dance work. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not change it up, but I'll definitely, the presentation's going to be uh, well thought through. And like I said, I'm going to add my little, I don't know if it'll be this stamp, but I'll definitely add a, a stamp and, and, and make it um, official um, on my influence that way. Because it did. It, it did influence us greatly. So... Um, but yeah, I'm gonna. I think I'll leave it at that. It's uh, 1 p.m. here. It's probably late and kind of early for some of you. Um, but I, I appreciate everybody joining in. And if anybody has anything they want to close out with, actually, there's something I wanted to share real quick. Uh, a for some of you guys to ponder because I have too much time on my hands sometimes, and I've said I've been thinking about uh, when we were discussing regarding the, uh, you know, why we work in the process, and. I don't know, maybe this is starting to get a little, um, a little high on a horse or something like that. I don't know. But mm. uh, one thing that came to mind was, you know, because a lot of people ask me, because they uh, hear about them, they see what I do, and they're like, well, I don't understand why you're doing this. You know, it's too complicated. You know, all the usual stuff you end up hearing. Right. But um, the, pres the idea is that I, how I've been and I've been really chewing on it lately and one thing I've been coming to it keeps coming in my head was it's kind of probably a crude question but you know would you ask a painter that yeah you know because like you know painters you have uh, oil acrylic watercolor yada yada, yada. it seems that as photo as photography we've always had the stigma of technology on us I it's just like you always had to stay with the current thing yeah you know the latest and greatest, that's where you have to work it. And we weren't really allowed to kind of go backwards. But now with digital, we actually have this ability to. You know, it's kind of like um, if you go into the history, the whole idea that, you know, when photography officially came out and was being used, the truth of painting it got set free. It was what people used to see in paintings, they always depicted as, you know, that was truth. Or it was ever an etching when they... Um, did newsprints of you know events that happened. Uh, you know what the artist depicted was considered truth. Yep. It was an interpretation. And then when photography came out, you know that became the new truth. You know what was depicted was there. And right. then well, with digital, you know what happened in the early '90s. Both uh, Terry and Quinn. I know you probably tired of hearing that story of the in what was it '90? It was around in '92. Uh, yeah. The photojournalist who doctored the the sky. Yeah, that's when I, yeah. And published it as truth because he was trying, uh, I don't know, convey the, uh, what was going on. Uh, I believe it was a Middle Eastern shot. Yeah, well, there was two of them. There was, there was the right. National, Ge National Geographic moved the cover, the mountain, the cover. Right, I forgot about the National Geographic uh, one. That, that, there, were, there were these building elements for me that I finally got out of the game in the late, mid to late 90s I was out. No, but I was wondering about other people's opinion about the fact is that, you know, how we, if, if it is true that what we have is a, a technical stigma that is on us, uh, maybe, I guess you can say publicly. Yeah. It's yeah. Something that's one of the key things that we have to, uh, you know, wrestle with. And, and you guys jump in here, but I'll throw this in real quick before somebody else jumps in. Um, think about it this way. <clears throat> uh, the technology is both a blessing and a curse, both in wet collodion and digital photography and Facebook and, and Hangouts, they all have these yin and yangs about them, right? And but this is this is what I often say um, while people look at me cross-eyed and say, well, wait a minute, you just talked about how great this process is in your brag and now you're, you're discounting it. I'm not discounting it, I'm just trying to say this, put this in context. So one of my, one of my greatest influences in writing 
uh, is or was Ernest Hemingway. In fact, I went up and had a portrait done on his grave. Uh, Jeannie actually did a Polaroid of me sitting on Hemingway's grave. My mother didn't live too far from him. Um, but Hemingway wrote, you know, Old Man on the Sea, 1953, Pulitzer Prize winning, all those, you know, I know he's machismo, and I, I disagree with a lot of the politics in it, but it, but it echoes. I like his Parisian stuff and some of his... Uh, his um, Spanish influence and all that. But anyway, no one ever, when they read Old Man on the Sea or anything, any of the short novels or stories by Hemingway, no one ever, ever asks what kind of typewriter he used, right? Exactly. No one ever asks that question. So th I guess the real question is, is why are we asking about Hemingway's typewriter rather than talking about what he's written? So we have a dilemma, not only is it technically, but it's aesthetically, because we're image makers. We tell stories and we, we give ideas through images or ask questions or make comments through images, uh, whether it's reporting the news or telling. You know, we're, we're all storytellers. That's what we do. We tell stories. That's, that's what we do. So how do we overcome the dilemma, not only from the technology, like, uh, you don't have a Adobe Cloud a CS7. You don't, you're not to have the... Eight terabyte petabyte drive, and you know, uh, how do you get away from that dilemma? And why are you choosing such a masochistic process to work in? And also overcome the dilemma of that it's not about the process. You know, one one side of our mouth, process, process. Look at this process. We're here because of this process. We're having this hangout because of this, right? And then on the other side, don't pay attention to the process. Pay attention to my work. You know. These are questions that we have to deal with, and, 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 and I'll let somebody else jump in if they want to comment on that. Well, the curse uh, is correct that, you know, the blessing and the curse of, of the different uh, mediums available and the different equipment that we use. The one thing that I know is, and I ask myself this a lot, if we didn't have the digital, the curse that we call it sometimes, would it have turned into the blessing of would I have pushed myself this far? Would yeah. I have gone back? I've always been curious, but when I was making prints in the dark room, I was satisfied enough. I don't yeah. think the curiosity to go back any further was there. Yeah. But I wanted to go completely different from digital, and the dark room just didn't cut it for me anymore. Yeah. Right. And I had to go back to where it all began. Yeah, and, and, I, and I'll ask you this, and Terry, anybody can answer. I'd love to know everyone's opinion on this, and, and forgive me. I don't know how many is viewing in chat right now. We were up there quite a few a minute ago, a lot of people that aren't on the video just watching the feed, but um, I hope I don't offend anyone, but I often find myself have after working in Collodion for so many years now, an alternative or historic process is what I call them, and for so many years now, it's really, really difficult for me to look at like silver gelatin prints and and just what I call regular photography. It's very I I can't get excited about it. I I, I just it leaves me flat. I'm I'm almost uninterested in in some ways, right? So so am I contradicting myself in this this you know this curse we call digital photography actually opened our eyes and made us realize what's yes. really important, the hard work, the aesthetic, whatever you're attracted to in the process, um, it, it, it really is a blessing. And, and that's that's my takeaway for the day. I'm going to change and my... We forgot to mention um, the beautiful light in China, and you can oh. probably see that in the movie. But the yeah. light was amazing. Yeah, the light there just, I mean, wow, speaking of aesthetics, yeah, I, I could photograph in that light. I... I'm up here at 5,493 feet right now, and the light is harsh and direct, and yes, there's a lot of UV here, and it's wonderful, but you can't make these dramatic, you, well, you can, but you have to pick the right day in the right place. These, these beautiful, if you saw those fisherman plates in hand, those things are just like, uh, they're just stunning. And I'll throw this out, shout out to Chamonix Camera, and... Um, and I can't remember who, they hooked me up with the camera and the lens, they had it shipped over, I uh, used a Dalmeyer 3B, um, 8x10, um, just, just speaking of gear, uh, so being, again, contradicting myself. But just so you know, um, a shout out to Chamonix and whoever hooked me up with it, Dalmeyer and, and Gray Studio. I mean, I was able to make those photographs and concentrate on making photographs rather than concentrating on the technical stuff. Excellent. Know. Because so, that was a very stressful. It, yeah, in right in the middle of a workshop kind of thing going on too. Yeah, 
But but back to your question or back to the comment um, of Rob's question of of how do we how do we overcome the 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 two sides of the mouth thing? How do we not be hypocrites about all of this and speak clearly and articulately and not disrespect or dis digital photography? Because I certainly don't, and I I know I know most clodianists really don't. There are some new people that come on and say, "Look, I hate digital photography so much. Look what I'm doing." You know that's. The, that's kind of a bad platform because you know digital photography isn't inherently bad. It's it's more about how we're using it. In fact, those kinds of examples are the very reason that we want to get a we want to get a better handle on what we're doing because if we don't, we end up finding ourselves um, again um, stuttering and blundering and not able to answer questions. One day, a lot of you will get up in front of a lot of people and talk about your wet collodion work. I know it. And when that day comes, you need to be prepared. You're going to get the toughest questions. You're going to get the most difficult and challenging comments. Um, I've lived through that. I've been prepared for that, and and are the best I can. And so far, you know, knock on wood, I've been okay. But had I not given as much thought to why I'm doing this and what the purpose of all this is in my projects, um, I would have been shot down and cut off at the knees immediately. So. While we talk about blessings and curses, really what we're really talking about, I think, is having your own personal reason for whatever you're using to have a reason for using it. Uh, you get in your car and just start it up and just start driving. You just drive. You, you have a reason to go. You, or you have a purpose to go somewhere. Or you, do you know where you're going? Most of the time you get in the car and you take care of that car and you fill gas up and you do all that. So when you're ready to go somewhere, your destination, you can get there. And and you have that in mind. So I work, you know, and a lot of people say, oh, that's, you got to let it flow, baby. Just come on, relax. Just let it come. And you want to photograph the pumpkin or the doorknob, go for it. It means that we're in the third phase of Venus and everything's cool. <laughs> I can't do that. I can't work that way. I can't either. <laughs> I can't buy into that. Sorry, guys. And I'll give you this quick example. In a critique one time, I, honest to God, this happened. Uh, this is where the lusciously gray comes from, or the paraphrase of it. Um, so we we're putting up work critiquing it, and the one, uh, you know, the photograph that was up there said, uh, the person said, they, they, we asked, why did you make this photograph? And the person said, because I felt lusciously gray. Okay? You felt lusciously gray. So let me get this straight. If you tell me that you feel a certain way, whether it's lusciously gray or blue or you're tired or you have a headache, the only person, I can't deny that. I can't argue with that. If you tell me you feel lusciously gray, unless we get into a bunch of psychobabble, I can't have a conversation with you about that. You said you feel that way. I, okay, you feel lusciously gray. The conversation has ended. The photograph has failed. We can't have a, a conversation about that photograph unless we talk in somewhat practical terms. I'm not talking about staying away from your emotions or feelings or those ideas that, that inspired the work. Not at all. Quite the contrary. What I am saying is I can't have a conversation with you when you tell me you made that photograph because you felt lusciously gray. I can't argue with that. I can't tell you, no, you didn't feel lusciously gray. You felt this way. I can't do that. Right, but if you tell me I made that photograph because of the history of Japan with China, okay, now we can start having a conversation about that photograph, right? The, these are the kinds of things that I I would really love to see people start embracing and talking about more. And nobody ever wants to talk about work. I, I did a long time, well, a year or two ago. I don't know when it was. I started doing. A, I I have. I'm an Apple guy. I love Macintosh. I always have. But I started doing these uh, Shift Command threes. These these screenshots of Facebook on somebody would post a photograph, and everybody would say, you know, like like, oh cool, you know. And uh, the comments would be like, um, what lens did you use? What kind of developer did you use? Uh, uh, what was the light like? How many strobes did you know? Nothing about the photograph. Mm -hmm. Nothing, ever. You, we can have these technical conversations, but my God, the photograph wasn't made because they used a Nikon 360 and 
a double cadmium John Coffer recipe collodion. That wasn't the reason it was made. There's got to be more to it than that. And I started uh, screen shooting, all doing screenshots of all of these, and just showing. Some of them had 18, 19, 20 comments that nothing about the photograph ever. It's all about the technical. And I understand the delicate nature of the difficulty of having these conversations online and people misreading and, and misinterpreting things. But what I would like to do, I would love to have some, some of these hangouts and uh, critiques if somebody wanted to bring work in or bounce ideas off one another or do those kinds of things a little bit. I think that would be wonderful. Awesome. Yeah, because I think there's, there's a lot to be gained from sharing knowledge and experience and knowing it in context. When I say, uh, oh, Terry, that's a wonderful image, but what about the composition on that? What were you thinking about that? Terry can respond appropriately. Or I say, hey, Carlos, you know, what were you doing with that lighting? Or, or what's the meaning of that shape that's coming down over here? You know, we can have these conversations in context and make them productive rather than a big ego rant that I want to slam you and I'm the best and this. I don't want to, I, I cannot stand that stuff. It drives me absolutely mad. But good constructive conversation. I need it as much as the the next. Exactly. Yeah. That's how we grow from each other, um, from each other's comments, and um, it's really important to hear what other people are thinking about your work because it provokes your own emotion, and provokes your own thoughts on why you took the image. Right, and it you know, we don't always you. know. Right, it informs you about more about. If you had an instinct to go out, for example, if you had an instinct to go out and, and photograph that old barn, you, you, and you, 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 just, you drove by it or you've driven by it a few times or you're just compelled exactly. to photograph that by exposing it to the public and saying, hey, I'm thinking about these ideas and here are some images. What do you guys think about it? What, what, what's, what's the vibe coming off of these things? It does. Well, again, I don't want to contradict myself. While it's important that the artist does the intellectual work, Hey, there's the, the first place you should be is around other artists having conversations about exactly. that. Exactly. And that's that's what really this is, and this is important. There's plenty of groups to talk about technical. That's that's why I was a little like, do I do I really want to come back and start talking about making negatives and doing you know? And I wanted to have a little more conversation about the more meaningful stuff. But I'll do the technical. I I will, and we can have conversations about that, and that's going to be great. But I would really love to see more of this kind of constructive um, critique, peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer critique, where you want to come in, you want to throw some ideas out. Um, I want to get you involved with, with the Chinese, the Asian people. Th that's going to explode. That is, that is where, if you want to exhibit, show, sell, prosper in this. Now those teachers are going to be teaching those young people in China all over the place. It's going to, it will really explode. They're going to be doing it right. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think I think we'll see, and I think we didn't get. I don't I don't think we got off on the right foot in with collodion in America, and I'll tell you why. And forgive me if I offend anyone, please. I I know what I'm about to say could be um, offensive or controversial. Um, we got off on the, in my opinion, broad brush, my opinion, we got off on the wrong foot in wet clothing in America. Uh, the revival started with Osterman and Coffer, and they were both um, into this uh, Civil War reenacting scene, right? And then there were some of the old other boys that, that, that were in that Civil War reenacting scene. And, um, and they started this movement through that kind of... Um, uh, venue, let's call it a venue. So um, they were all reenacting. So so it gave them purpose. It, why do you want? You know, it gave them purpose, and I get that. They they wanted to go, and they said, you know, they'd sell a, a quarter plate for forty bucks or something at the the reenactment and all that. Absolutely no interest in that for me. Absolutely zero. Absolutely no interest. Um, I don't understand it. I don't get it. I have no interest. Do I have hit, uh, interest in history and the American Civil War? Yes, I do. The photography of that era, obviously, absolutely. The aesthetic affects my informs my work, affects my work, all that. But I think we got off on the wrong foot by this. It wasn't started for a new way to express oneself as an artist or a photographer. It was started for almost a practical or commercial reason. And the wrong foot being that that's what's driven 
Descartes uh, pulled, or I don't, want, I shouldn't use those analogies talking about civil war. That's what's driving the train, let's say, or the car, whatever you want, analogy you want to use. And so my opinion is, is, is we got started in that. The uh, the the forum board that opened just before mine was uh, civil war board. It's closed down now, but but the owner of that yeah C civil war reenactors board. The owner of that board wrote me an email. This was in 2003 or so. And I didn't know the guy, and he said, "Hey, Quinn, what what are you doing opening this Collodian.com thing, this forum board? I already have one." And I said, "I well, well, I appreciate that, and I've seen your board, and I've been on your board. Um, uh, your board's geared toward the commerce and the the uh, the movement of civil war re reenacting. It's it's geared all toward." The technical and was plywood invented in 1868? Is this proper to wear at this thing? And do I have you know what kind of lens should I use? And it was geared all around being period correct. And you know, God bless them. I you know I have nothing against that. If they want to do that, that's fine. But I said in my email, in my response, I said I'm starting this board because I'm an artist that uses photography, and I want other artists that use photography to be able to have a place to go to talk about things other than if plywood was invented in 1967 or not. You know, we're, those conversations are irrelevant and meaningless to us. Our conversations are like these conversations. We right. give each other food for thought and share ideas and creatively, technically a lot of times too, no, no problem, but all for a different motivation. We're all motivated by our own personal desire to express ourselves or to tell our stories or to tell a story or several stories, whatever we're doing and doesn't really have anything to do with commerce until we get in the galleries and we sell our work and 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 that's a lovely thing to do and it's wonderful and I'm greatly blessed and privileged for that but but I think we got off on the wrong foot and to Jeannie's point China is starting off in a better position and I think those ideas will grow um, more without the animosity of some competing idea for using the process it's starting out purely as an art form, purely as a new way, a new way, <laughs> a new way to express oneself and not uh, bound up by commerce or ideas of, of something else. You know? So um, that's what I'm hoping. We'll, we'll see. I could be. Well, Quinn, the one thing I could I want to say to that is that I, I agree that I would I would not be um, as interested in. Are you still there? Yes, we're here. Oh, okay. I th it just went totally dead on me here. So. Okay, that's okay. okay. Um, I, I wouldn't be interested in doing the Civil War either. I've had people talk to me about it because I know people that actually do the Civil War reenactment, and that's their thing, you know. Yeah. Um, I agree with you that I could not engage in regular conversation, you know, in that area either because I am also an artist. And, and maybe it got, you know, it had to start somewhere here for the revival. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe maybe these groups that you're starting here is a great way for us to actually have an explosion. Because I do think that it's not done. I think that we're at the beginning of it, period. Yeah. And and yeah. I think that we need to go forward knowing that this is the way we do it, that's yeah. the way they do it, yeah. and there can be an explosion. And you know what's really funny is we could end up merging with them at some point in another way. We don't know. Yeah. Um, the civil warring actors? Yes, I mean I wouldn't probably be yeah. photographing them, yeah. but I'm just saying that they that's their thing and no, that's and, and you know, and Ter Terry it, to your credit. Yeah. To your credit. There's a lot of great technically there, proficient art uh, 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 technicians in that field. Uh, but it's dying. It's going away. It's, it, it is. is. It is. And so we're here, we're picking it up. And and you've yeah, started I, I something like great and yeah. we need to go Great. I'm glad they started, even though it wasn't our cup of tea. Let's grab it and keep going with it because I, I, I think love, our explosion could be as big as the one that you're talking about in China. I love your attitude, and that's a great attitude to have, and I totally great agree with that. Great metaphor, too. Pardon What's me? Just, that? Great tea metaphor or uh, idiom. <laughs> what, what tea? Oh. What? Our cup of tea. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, there you can see. I didn't even catch that. Good good catch, Jeannie. Um, you totally agree with you, Terry. I think. I think um, um, I sh maybe maybe I misspoke. Maybe I should take that back. But I really believe that the basic philosophy. I shouldn't say the wrong foot. It, it got off on a co commercial standpoint rather than a creative artistic standpoint. And I agree with Terry. Well said. I 
totally agree. Well, the fire I hasn't been. I don't, there. I don't want Civil War writers dissing me an email and sending me a bunch of crap, please. I, no, I, I knew what you meant. I knew exactly what you were saying, and and I I, I agree with exactly what you're saying. Um, what I'm thinking is, you know, when you're um, you're varnishing your plates and you've got the little flame underneath it. You know, maybe the flame's just been not been hot enough, and now it's time. You know, it's like there the flame's go. hot now. So, I think. I mean, I'm so excited about this this whole um, method, and it's only been two years for me. And I've mm. learned from your books. I've learned from those. There's some great groups on Facebook. Um, oh. The Collodian Bastards group. Yeah. Um, I'm a girl bastard. I'm all proud of it. <laughs> I love it. Um, I built my bastard box, and I'm out shooting remotely now, and I love being mobile. Yeah. And nice. I learned from all of those guys. Um, yeah. They yeah. were all really helpful. And yeah. so there is a fire out there. There yeah. is a fire, and now it's gonna. It's gotta. It, we've just gotta ignite it and and run with it. Let it burn. Yeah, good for you, Terry. And I agree. Um, this is by no means am I the only source for information on this. Not at all. No, in no way, shape, or form. But I would. I would throw the caveat in that while those groups and and I know most of the people in those groups, and I've dealt with them on on one occasion or the other, or one de uh, instant or another. Those the, and they're great groups. I will go back to my point and make the point again that, that, that you're right. I hope we're at the beginning of the new revival, maybe we can f coin this right now, of the new revival of the process for personal and artistic expression rather than for technical or commercial or some of these other ideas that are, because most of these groups out there, they're, they're happy to tell you, you know, there are so many more people out there that know m so much more about 19th century lenses than I do or things that I've been right. around for the last 15 years. Uh, kudos to them. Kudos to them. And that's wonderful information when you need it. What, what I see year after year after year after year after year that never changes, that I've just been begging people to please, let's, let's work toward this together and change, is move into a direction of, of making work that, that's oriented to have a purpose. Exactly. And if you want to say, if you're making work so you can be in an exhibition next year in China, make that work. Make it cohesive. Have something to say about it. I, I want to give people a goal. If you, if you don't know what to do, let's talk about what you can do. Let's come yeah. into these groups and have conversations about your ideas. Just like Terry said, we can feed off, and Rob too, we can feed off of exactly. one another. And, 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 and have that's how that happen. And, and, and that's exactly how I had to do it, Quinn. I took, you know, your book and the email exchange with you, and I, you know, you're not available all the time, and I can't expect you to answer every single question for me, and I didn't know anyone who knew the medium. Sure. So I met this other group of people online, and I just started, um, you know, we started friending each other, and I would learn little bits and pieces. I don't know if any of them are artists. I know sure. that they know the method, and I know that we feed off of each other. Yeah. Um, I had to learn the method in order to create my art and right. now I'm creating art with a method that I learned from multiple people and exactly. um, and now the conversation the exchange that we're all having now is going to start taking it to that next level that you are looking for the fire in I'm so happy to hear that and you're right uh, people of often ask me who did you learn the process from and my philosophy is let's let's forget about I mean let's not forget about who we learn the process for, from but really what it is is you teach yourself the process. You're the one that went out and got those resources. You're the one exactly. that time writing the emails and asking the questions. You're the one that, that sourced from several areas and picked the best for you. And those are all wonderful things and they're great things. So you've got your car ready. You put the fuel in it. You've got new tires. You had the oil changed. You've got your map out. Where are you going to go? Exactly. Where that is the that is your go. question. That is how you're sitting end, here end just, with that. <laughs> we've been sitting we go? at the start line for years. I want to start already. Yeah, hello. <laughs> <laughs> So, Quinn, you just answered the beginning of your next group session. Where are we going to go? <laughs> We're ready to drive. We got our car ready. Accelerate. Let's do it. Let's do it. Well, I'm going to shut my big mouth up, and I'm going to bid everyone a farewell. And I thank you all so much for the conversation. This was the best session we've had yet. Awesome. And I had a great time. Sorry if I jumped in and started monopolizing. This has been such a great conversation, and I don't have anyone to talk to about this stuff at this level, so I am, like, thrilled that you're doing this. Well, thank you so much. We're, we're thrilled I love it. to have you. We're thrilled to have everybody. 
I, I just I can't emphasize enough how much I appreciate and I'm honored by people spending time in my world like this and becoming our world. And I, I just I'm greatly appreciative and I thank you all. I'll sign off. It's one twenty four, so we went uh, three and a half hours almost. Wow. Uh, that's a good session. <laughs> it was really nice meeting everybody too. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll put I'll put a date up for next month, and I hope you put it in your diaries or calendars, and you hope you can all meet again here. And let's have those conversations. Let's talk about think about um, what what conversations we can inspire and um, make happen next time. Um, Dale just joined in again. No, this is Dale. I was just so noticing his comments over there. They're really good comments uh, that he made. I didn't read them all before, did you? Oh, yeah. yeah, that's another thing. If you click on the comments, you can see the feed over here. Oh. Some people that aren't in the, uh, in the it's, it's right here. There you go. Yeah, there it is, Dale. Hey, welcome back, buddy. We're just closing it down now. But, China uh, is a land of contrasts, yeah, he said. Yeah, definitely. You just gave your age, Terry. That's what he said. Yes, <laughs> I did. That was a long time ago I gave it. I'm older now. <laughs> Well, I was I was born in 1964. Yeah, so. uh, well, I'm only two years younger than oh, older. Well, no, I'm younger. I'm younger. What are we doing? I'm two years younger. See, I, I can't do math. Dollars. I'm an artist, and I don't do math. So, <laughs> at least public math, huh? Exactly. We're not old anymore? We we just are. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're doing fine. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, appreciate it. Nice Until meeting you all. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Later. Yeah. <laughs>